All right, well, it seems to be six o'clock. If uh, we're ready, we can get started. Everybody still here? Okay, uh, I'm Ron St. Jean, and uh, can you hear it? Some guy that's, oh, of course, it's your machine. The handsome guy that's running the tech is Connor McIver. Uh, we're hosting this forum. If you're not speaking, please mute yourself because every noise in the world is coming through. Uh, Connor and I are hosting this forum to provide voters an opportunity to learn a bit about the candidates so they can make an informed decision at the polls on March 8th. Uh, I think what we'll do tonight is uh, give everybody a two minute opening or a chance for a two minute opening statement. And for the select board candidates, uh, if there's a general question for all four, uh, we'll give you about a minute and a half to answer those questions. That'll probably leave us time for a dozen or 15 questions if they're for everybody. Um, if there's questions for one person in particular, we might go a little longer. And we also have not just select board, uh, we have four select board candidates for uh, two seats of three years each. We have uh, one candidate for a three year seat uh, as a trustee of the trust fund. And we have one candidate for a supervisor of the checklist, which is a marathon six year term. Uh, so those, uh, the people that are running for trust, trust, trustee of the trust fund and supervisor of the checklist are running unopposed, but they're kind of new people to the political world here. And uh, we want them to be identifiable to people. So we'll give them a chance to speak tonight as well. And hopefully there'll be some questions for them. So why don't we get started and just kind of picking on select person candidates alphabetically, Joyce Capiello, looks like you're up first for about a two minute opening. So. All right. So thanks to Ron St. Jean for moderating and for our town um, administrator, Connor McIver, for doing all the background on this. Um, and now a little bit about me. Um, I've lived here for 40 some years. Uh, my husband and I got married here and raised our children here. I've um, probably voted in every municipal election and paid attention to town politics, but have not had the time in my life to serve um, until uh, until now. I volunteered with N60 hour, in 68 hours of hunger. And um, Dan and I did lots of coaching of sports when our children were little. And I'm currently an alternate trustee of the library. Um, a little bit of me work. Uh, life has been as a nurse practitioner, and I taught nursing for 30 years at the university. Um, probably many of you have been cared for by some of our uh, students or graduates, and just a call out to all of our graduates who have worked so hard during the pandemic. Um, I started my career working in hospitals and acute care where I love the pace, but over time really became much more interested in prevention and so moved to the community and worked at private practices, community health centers, and then a nonprofit. And that experience of really wanting to work with people to prevent illness is the perspective I bring to the select board. So I think we should look at our infrastructure and we should look at that from the perspective of prevention. How can we spend a little bit of money to take care of problems um, or maintenance so that things much last much longer and we spend less money um, over the long term? And I feel like that perspective on prevention is actually a very fiscally responsible um, perspective. Um, Throughout my career, I've served on and chaired lots of boards and um, uh, com uh, committees. Um, and from that experience, I've learned to listen effectively. And so I think my time is up and I'll talk some more later. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll go to Cassandra Dearborn. Hello. I guess we have the same time around. <laughs> Um, so I'm Cassie Dearborn. Um, I've called Barrington my home for 11 years. Um, what I care about is furthering a sense of um, the community we have in Barrington, um, which is really what brought me here. Um, I think that community resources are vital to those who need them. Um, and for those of us who want to um, keep our wealth and grow our wealth, um, it's important. And to get to know our neighbors, I think it's, it's um, something that that is really strong in our community and something I really want to keep happening. 
Um, I think that the heart of Barrington is a rural one, and I don't think we should be envisioning, envisioning it as a new suburb of Dover or Portsmouth or Boston. I do feel like um, uh, that's kind of something that's, that's really important to me, is I, I'd like to keep it rural. Um, I feel like the best policymakers are those who are not there for power, but for those for but to be a servant leader. And um, that's something I have experience with both professionally and at home. As a mechanical engineer, I've spent much of my career listening to the needs and um, specifications of those that I've served, finding solutions and taking action when action is needed. Um, I'm a mother to four school age kids and I've been a foster mother to several others. Um, I've attended and volunteered at our church in Barrington um, for about 15 years, growing the Operation Christmas Child program and um, running a library there. Um, I've been grateful to be part of our um, local youth, athletic, and academic teams. Um, math counts as today. It's a math team that we're on, we have in middle school, sometimes educating as a coach. I'm happy to hike through the many trails that we have in the town forests, and I absolutely love the opportunity that our property has given us to raise a flock of chickens and have a large garden and harvest our maple tree sap. Um, these are the things that I'm hoping that we can preserve and grow in Barrington. Thank you. Thank you, Cassie. Uh, Robert Gibson is up next. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. I'd like to thank everybody uh, for attending this evening and giving me an opportunity to introduce myself. I'm Robert Gibson. I grew up in New Hampshire. I've been in Barrington for the last 17 years uh, with my partner, Joe, who grew up in Barrington. Um, we enjoy having a farm. Uh, we also have uh, chickens and, and gardens, and I very much appreciate the rural nature of and charm of Barrington and hope to see that maintained. I, I very much also enjoy the, the, the trails and uh, um, you'll find us hiking the, the many trails around Barrington. Um, I'm running for select board as an opportunity to give back to my community. Uh, I have a degree in microbiology. I have a master's in public health. Uh, I've worked at the University of New Hampshire for the last 28 years at the State Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, and I've been the director of the lab uh, for the last nine years. Um, with that work, I, I bring experience and skills that are I feel relevant to town administration um, in areas such as budgets, personnel, serving on boards and committees, working with state and federal agencies, regulatory officials, stakeholder engagement. Um, a member of the Farm Bureau for the last 15 years, and I serve on, serve on the uh, Stratford County Farm Bureau uh, 2014. And I'm a member of the Barrington Historical Society. Uh, if elected, I look forward to listening to our citizens and working with the board and town employees to help uh, keep Barrington a beautiful and resilient community. And I look forward to answering any questions you have. Thanks, Robert. Michael Host. Hi, uh, thank you, Ron, Connor. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Host. I'm running for the position of select board member. Um, I've been a New Hampshire resident since 1985, and a Barrington resident since 2000. Uh, I've married uh, for over 35 years and have raised two children here in Barrington. Um, I was active in the, uh, the Boy Scout troop here for many years as a chairperson and merit badge counselor. Um, and I'm, I'm currently uh, have been active this year in the uh, uh, advisory budget committee. Uh, I've got uh, two years as a uh, resource management and, and production control uh, person. Uh, I've got uh, a bachelor's degree in computer information systems and a master's in management. Uh, and I'm retired military, 22 years in the Air Force and a Gulf War vet. Uh, currently employed at Exeter Hospital as the quality department as a uh, database administrator statistical analyst. Um, I'm not going to go and promise a whole bunch of stuff. I'd just say that I'm a fiscal conservative. Uh, my, my position is to get the most value for our money, spend only as much as necessary, and keep our uh, municipal taxes as low as possible. Uh, it's our money that uh, goes and pays for all these things, and I'd like to go and keep our money in our pockets, so not the state or the, or the towns. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. 
Uh, next up is a candidate for trustee of the trust fund, Chelsea Fitzgerald. Should be very short because um, <laughs> it's just me. So my name is Chelsea Fitzgerald. Um, I've been living in Barrington house owning, I guess, since 2014. However, my grandparents were the Robies. So you've probably at one point saw me running through somewhere greenhouse sometimes. So I have been here quite a long time. Um, and I guess I'm just kind of applying, trying to get my toes wet into politics and, you know, why not start right here in your own, you know, backyard, your town. So that's kind of where, where I am. And I just kind of feel a need to kind of help people. That's what I do all day at my job. I'm a recruit recruitment coordinator for a nonprofit. So I feel like I can apply a lot of that to this role that I, well, anybody decides to run, I guess, against me, but I don't think so now. So hopefully I can just continue to kind of help people through two, two different roles that I do every day, besides being a mom and everything else that moms do. But that's pretty much it. If anybody has any questions for me, I'd love to answer them. Okay, hey, thanks, Chelsea. And candidate for supervisor of the checklist, Virginia Schoenwald. Uh, unmute yourself, Virginia. Uh, hi, um, I'm Virginia Schoenwald. I've lived in Barrington since 1985. Um, and I am running for supervisor of the checklist because I feel like it's something that I can do to contribute to the town. Um, I am a retired school librarian and I feel like supervisor of the checklist requires me to be somewhat detail oriented. So, um, and that's what I am. Um, I have volunteered for the Barrington Trails Committee and uh, in the schools while my kids were growing up in town. And uh, I also volunteer at a local soup kitchen. And I'm sure that's all you need to know about me, but thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Virginia. All right, now uh, for the audience with questions, if you can just click that little hand there that indicates you wanna raise your hand. I think Connor will be able to tell uh, you've done that and uh, call on you. Uh, please identify yourself and specify who your question is for, uh, whether it's an individual or all the candidates or whatever you like, and then we'll go from there. So, uh, okay, whoever's ready. Great, yep, we'll start with Karen Town. Karen, un unmute yourself if you're there. Not hearing anything on my okay. end, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is Ashley Matt Town. I'm using my wife's computer. Uh, she's sitting here next to me. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to address. And uh, so my question is to the uh, four select uh, four candidates for select board. And, and I would ask you to be as expansive as you can be, given the nature of the question. Uh, the emphasis in Barrington uh, Financial Management has been to keep the uh, overall costs low. And while I appreciate that in terms of being a taxpayer myself, having an attitude of fiscal conservative conservatism without regard to future needs and associated costs always ends up costing much more. Would you, could you comment on how you plan to manage the refinances in our town knowing that we must need, uh, we have to grow our infrastructure. Our town will grow. We have no choice over that. Our town will grow. And so we must manage that. Can you address that in the context of uh, overall fiscal management? Thanks, Matt. And we will start with Cassie. Oh, she's <laughs> All right, hi. Um, thanks, Matt. So, um, one thing that I noticed at this last uh, deliberative session is I thought that our town was doing a pretty good job looking forward um, to upcoming needs um, th for the next few years. But one observation I made was in regards to the library, where if we aim really low, which is what I feel like the conservative nature is, if we aim really low, um, then we're, we're basically going to be saving under inflation, which basically steals the money from the taxpayers because it it buries it in the ground. Um, so 
I'm I'm not a fan of the idea of being so conservative that we don't actually meet the needs that we need to meet, um, because at some point um, inflation will catch up with the limited savings that we have, and we're going to find that we need to spend it and we don't have the money. Um, so I do feel like being proactive is uh, important when you see a need coming up. Um, however, I'm I'm not a huge fan of um, uh, doling out money at every um, single request uh, that comes through. Like I'm I'm I I am technically a conservative um, in in some sense of the word, but I believe in local government. But I believe we, our local government needs to take care of its people. Um, uh, I think I probably said enough there. Yep, uh, and I was exactly a minute and a half, so good job. Oh, perfect. Okay, Robert. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I certainly, we, we moved to Barrington, um, you know, 17 years ago because uh, it was affordable and I, I wanted uh, a piece of land to, to garden and, and um, you know, so many of the, the surrounding towns and stuff were, were, were out of reach at the time. And so I, I can certainly appreciate um, wanting to have things be affordable. I um, having run a, a lab for um, the, the last nine years, uh, I, I am work, used to working within budgets. Um, I think I'd like to explore what are the creative, uh, outside the box ways that we might be able to find additional funding. And when we grow the tax base, uh, doing so in a way that ensures that Barrington remains beautiful and keeps the charm that it has. You know, I think maybe, you know, renewable resources, um, you know, other other grants and opportunities, whatever we can do to try to bring in additional uh, funding um, uh, would be an approach that I'd want to take. Um, I think that's about it. Hey, thank you, Michael. I should be on mute. Um, yes, uh, going into the future and planning has been something that actually uh, quite a number of our department uh, managers here in town have been concerned with. Um, I know that uh, Rick Walker and fire department has a, a plan uh, for going out 10, 15 years for replacements and upgrades on, on his equipment. Um, he probably also has one for expansion on the, uh, the fire department building itself and that to go and include uh, any new acquisitions that we get. The, fire, the uh, police department is also concerned with planning into the future. Uh, we've we've hired a couple of new uh, patrolmen in that, and uh, you'll you'll see that uh, probably in the uh, the budget if you go in and look at that. Uh, we've got plans for expansion and, and moving things around uh, for the highway department and transfer station, and all of those uh, we have warrant articles out there that accumulate money in order to go and plan. And, uh, and fund these things for the future. So um, yeah, we, we are going and looking at that and I wanna go and continue to go and plan for the future like that. Uh, if we have expansion on the population in town, then we'll go and we'll also need to go and expand those uh, services that we need for them. Thank you, Michael. Joyce. Sure, thanks. Um, I'd like to use the example um, of a uh, highway department. So we had a 10 year highway plan. Uh, we didn't always follow the recommendations of that on an annual basis. So we have a new uh, plan done by Street Scan that I don't think we have the actual plan yet, but the figures presented by Street Scan are that if you have a crack in the road, it costs a dollar to fix that. And if you let that go, it costs eight or nine dollars down the road. So I want to make sure that we're spending that money um, as often as we need to. So, you know, probably annually uh, to make sure that we are getting um, our money for that. 
Um, another issue in the town, we have a very aging um, gym. So the recreation department went through an entire tank of oil in 10 days during the last cold spell, um, sooner than their automatic delivery, but they don't have enough insulation in those walls and probably not in the uh, ceiling either. So uh, we should look at making that building more energy efficient so we're not spending so much on oil. So those are the kinds of things I would like to see us have a plan for attending to. Thank you. Next question. Chief Walker is next, Mr. Moderator. Okay, go ahead, Rick. Thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. This is for all four candidates. As you understand, uh, public safety is very near and dear to my heart. And um, I'm concerned about um, adequate staffing for our police department and for our EMS department, fire and EMS departments. And obviously we understand that staffing is expensive, but we need to keep moving forward. And I would like all four candidates to just briefly explain to me where they see uh, increased staffing for both police and fire in their, uh, where it fits in their agenda. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. OK, we'll start with Robert. OK, thank you, Chief Walker. Um, so I, I am going to be a proponent of always making sure that um, we are adequately staffed, um, when, especially when it comes to uh, emergency. And and if we are understaffed, that poses all sorts of problems down the road, poses problems for retaining and, and getting good help. Um, so just where I stand is, is that I, I am in support of um, adequate staffing and, and, and fairly compensated staffing as well, um, whether that be our teachers or in our uh, municipal workers and emergency services. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, uh, Chief, thank you. Um, I think you know that uh, you know as part of the uh, the advisory budget committee and that we uh, we recommended that um, the personnel be authorized to be hired uh, for to cover the EMS and to go and cover the uh, the additional slots for the uh, police department. Uh, the the services, um, as you had described at previous select board meetings. Um, were not adequately covered during the night. Response times were much higher. Um, I, with additional people in that, you have the chance to get there faster um, and actually save lives. And the same thing with the, with the police department is they, they had many nights where they did not have any coverage, uh, no backup for any of the officers that we had there. And we do have situations where their response their responses are very limited uh when there's only one person when they have two or even three people on that their responses are much more varied and they can go and tailor it in order to go and uh, meet the situation so we uh, are definitely in uh, uh, agreement with you and with the uh, police department uh, that you need the, the personnel and you should have them thank you Hey, Joyce. Sure. Well, I want to thank Chief Walker for all his years of service, and I know that he works way more than uh, what he's uh, being paid for. Um, and I think we need to, as the other candidates saying, we need to support these positions. Um, no resident ever thinks they're going to need fire services or emergency services, but response time for um, emergency services for someone having a stroke or heart attack um, certainly can make the difference in survival rates. So, and everyone wants that. They may not think they need it until they're in the moment, but I think most residents would uh, uh, would want that, and perhaps with a good messaging around that, we can convince um, the residents of the town to vote for those kinds of um, personnel that will keep all of our residents safe. Thank you. Next question. Uh, maybe Cassie Dearborn, Ron. Oh, did we skip Cassie? I believe yeah. so. Well, I really did. <laughs> I, knew, I knew that. I'm getting there. <laughs> Numbering is not my strong point. Okay, go ahead, Kathy. 
Um, well, I don't need to take up too much time um, being redundant, but I, I also agree that if if um, our police chief or fire chief says we need more staffing, then that that's something that I would look into. Um, it's something I would support. Uh, I have had uh, an emergency, our fire or our car caught on fire and um, it was frightening and I was very thankful. It wasn't in Barrington, but it, I was very thankful for our fire department in that town. And um, yeah, well, it's a service we need and I know it. So if, if that's an issue, then I absolutely support it. That's it. <laughs> Thanks, Cassie. Thank you all. Okay. Next Who's... question will be from Sandy Woodcock. Okay, Sandy, go ahead. Do you unmute yourself? There we go. All right, can you hear me? Yes. yes. All right, everybody seems to be asking questions about fiscal responsibility, but the library is a little bit more fluent. I mean, everybody needs emergency services. Can you hear me okay? Yes. And, and and things like that. The library's more, yeah. So I just want to know wh where the candidates stand on trying to get a town library that fits the the population that we have here. Or if they think this one we have now is adequate. Yeah. So let's hear. Let's hear. And this is for all the select board candidates. Yeah. Yep. Okay. We'll start with Michael. Thank you. Um, libraries are necessary in, in all towns. Am, am I on mute or no? no You're I'm good. Not. You're good. Um, the question is, you know, how much are the voters in the town willing to go and spend and over time to go and replace or expand the library for that thing? Uh, the other thing is, is that are we getting just a library? Are we getting a town meeting place? You know, there, these, these are questions that uh, have been on the ballot in previous years and have been voted down. Um, that sends a message to everybody else in the town in addition to the, uh, the town managers and uh, select board that perhaps the uh, the solutions that have been proposed are not um, not adequate for uh, what people were, will agree with. Um, and why should I go and I force a, a decision on people who have already gone and spoken and said that we're not happy with this particular uh, solution? Uh, would you please come back and, and provide us with a new one? Uh, it's hard to argue with that. Okay, thank you, Joyce. You're Joyce, you're muted. muted. Joyce. Um, we have this incredible tradition in New Hampshire. We were the first state to ever have a public library. Um, there were social libraries that were happening around there where you had to pay a fee, but in 1700, we became the first public library. So I think that's just an amazing um, tradition. Um, and I think libraries not only is a great place to get books and for children's program and teens program and adult programs, um, but we have tech support in the library. We've got a lot of other services that um, people use um, in the library. And we have to look at the aging building that that library is built on. So in the past three weeks, um, both the library and the rec department were closed because of septic issues. They were able to get the blockage out of the septic, but they were told uh, that it's a really old system. So that's probably going to go completely um, at some point. And I mentioned the heating problems. The library had some additional heat on their level, so they were able to keep services open the day that the rec department had to close um, um, because of that. Um, Probably all of you and this know that the library is just stretched to capacity. If uh, 
someone wants a new book in the library, the librarians have to figure out which book um, to get rid of because there is just no more room um, for that. So if we're going to have a vibrant library, which I think can be a really um, good source of community spirit for a town, uh, we're going to need a bigger space. Uh, what that will look like, I'm not sure. The library is looking at um, their current let's, plans. Let's time, and let's time, Joyce. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Cassie? Hey, um, so the library we have is too small and I definitely want a bigger library. That's um, that is it is on my agenda. I do want a bigger library. Um, what I hear from people is that the design we have is not what they want. It's not no, we don't want a bigger library. It's no, this isn't the design we want. And so what I want is to find the balance between what the town wants and what the library is putting forward. Um, so, uh, what that looks like is probably a lot of back and forth and conversation. I'm willing to have that conversation, um, with people that use the library, with the library foundation. Um, I do think it's a thing we need to solve now and not later, and we need to put our money in now and not later. Um, and I have toured a lot of libraries in the community because our kids were doing, um, travel soccer and, um, we lack, <laughs> we definitely lack. I've seen some really good libraries out there and there are community spaces that do allow for collaboration, for play, for meetup. And I know one argument is use the middle school. And I personally have had a little trouble scheduling at the middle school, even with kids in the middle school. So I really want a space that anyone at any age can meet up, collaborate and work um, that is open to the public and not a barrier based on income. Thanks. Thank you, Cassie. Robert. So <clears throat> being uh, the last to speak, I, I'm going to probably echo or uh, what, what a lot of people have already said. Um, I am in support of a, a better library. Uh, the library that we have now is, is undersized. Um, I have contributed to the, the library foundation in, in the past. Um, so there are a lot of people that are investing in, in trying to um, make this a success. And I would agree that I think in, in the last election, the, the town was not ready for that at that moment for for that uh, style of library but that you know it's being revisioned uh, i think there's lots of opportunity to to come <clears throat> to to an agreement with what is an appropriately sized library that we can all be proud of uh, in barrington thank you the next question next question will be from steve saunders hey, go ahead steve You have to you unmute me? yourself. Uh, I guess I'm not muted. Yeah, we got you. Oh, there you are. Yep, you're coming okay, in on the phone. This, Go ahead. This, this is Steve Saunders. Yes. Um, going before the uh, towns in the next election is a, is a budget, um, and I would like to hear from each of the candidates uh, what they feel uh, about that budget and whether they feel there is any changes. Uh, that they would have liked to have seen in this 2022 budget. Is this just for select board candidates or for everybody? It's for the select board, please. Okay. Uh, we'll start with Joyce. Sure. So I would have liked to have seen the advisory committee um, come out with some support uh, for the warrant for the library. You funded it at zero, um, and I would have liked to have you funded at least at the limit of last year. Um, going forward, I know that the police department is really um, wanting some extra space, and so the, that didn't come up for this year, but that may come up uh, in future budgets. Um, other than the library, I thought um, putting the money aside uh, in the warrant articles for saving for new vehicles for police and fire and road um, was was very responsible. It looked good. So thank you. thanks for the question. Hey, Cassie. Um, I agree with Joyce. Uh, the only issue I had was the library, and I felt um, at this point, um, it was such a small token that it, it's almost not worth it. I'm still going to support the 20,000 that they put in, but um, we need to actually set a, a 
plan just like the, the fire department say, okay, we're saving for five years out, three years out, and this is what we need to put in here, here, and here. And I was disappointed that the advisory board, um, no one supported it. Um, so thank you. Hey, Robert. So I think the the budget looked very sound. Um, I, I also agree that the the library allotment was was too low. I think that we really need to be forward thinking about um, saving for that and in some reserves. Um, I always appreciate when I when I go as a voter and have seen that very often the the select board is is unanimous in in their support of of these articles and and that always as a voter made me feel good to know that you know they were as a team working together and and coming to a consensus and so um the there seemed to be a lot of consensus and certainly at the deliberative session which i i was able to see online they they there was not uh, much contention at all about the budget um, um but again other than the library i thought it seemed like a very sound budget okay michael okay Good evening, Steve. Thanks for the, making the question. Um, I'm happy with the uh, with the budget that's been produced for this year. Uh, as far as the library uh, is concerned, and that warrant article and why it was uh, turned down by the advisory budget committee. Last year's uh, warrant article was for twenty five thousand dollars. This year's request was for seventy five thousand dollars. And we thought that that was a very unusual jump in request. And we had made a request to the library to go and explain why they needed to go and have such a massive jump. And we did not receive a, uh, an adequate uh, response from them. And because of that, and we were looking for ways to go and keep our uh, municipal tax rate down. We thought that um, if they can't go and explain it well enough, then perhaps they don't need to go and have it. Um, so we, we recommended a zero on that. Uh, other departments uh, in the town went and thought that, you know, they could go and spare some extra money and they transferred uh, approximately $20,000 uh, of their budgets over to the library to go and make up some of that. That's still not as much as the 25,000 they'd originally, requested but it was a substantial amount um but nowhere near seventy five thousand dollars thank you okay next question next question is from lindsay hi lindsay me we can hear you now yes hi everyone this is lindsay pzrs um just a quick question for the four select board candidates um, I think three of you mentioned in your opening statement that um, the sense of community in Barrington is really important to you. And as a mom in town and as an educator in town, the sense of community is very important to me as well. And I feel like over the last few years, our sense of community has kind of changed a bit. And of course, we have some um, you know, obstacles outside of our control that contributed to that. Um, but I'd like to hear from the four of you about your actual steps to work towards building a tighter community in Barrington. Thanks, Lindsay. We'll start with Cassie. You're muted, Cassie. Oops, jumping right to it. Um, so I think uh, a lot of the issue that we've seen in Barrington is not unique to Barrington. I think that um, issues that have come up are really polarizing one way or the other. Um, and I don't feel like, um, I feel like that will get better. And I, I don't feel like it's necessarily related to um, our sports teams or our math teams or anything like that. The things that really like bring neighbors to neighbors. Um, but I feel like on a public forum, we are seeing a lot, uh, a lot more contention. I, I would like to see, uh, more spaces and that would be the library where we can come together and meet each other over things that um, we can not bring politics in things like uh, video game competitions that used to be held at the library um, you know meeting up at sports events which were closed and are now opening up um, i think we're going to get there 
um, just based on things opening back up and coming back together. And I do feel like the library would be a space to do that in. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, I, I would agree with, with with Cassie about creating spaces that that brings community together, right? So so places like libraries, um, places like all of the tr the trails. I, I I love seeing the 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 trails uh, getting more use and uh, people coming together. I mean, outdoor activities have certainly gone up because of of COVID, and and we all look forward to uh, the days when when COVID can hopefully be gone. But um, I think anything that that we can do as a town to to help support each other uh, in services, um, help support town employees in, in their, their, their job satisfaction, help um, businesses that, that come in and, and are doing things to, to help the community. Um, community is very important. And so whatever decisions that we make, um, we need to recognize and look at how will this impact community and the relations of our citizens. So. Thank you. OK, Michael. Well, it's easy to get a good sense of uh, community when you only have 2,000 people in a town and all of them are farmers. Uh, that's not the situation we have here anymore. We've got close to 10,000 people in the town um, all, in all walks of life, in all different types of, uh, of jobs and careers. Um, we all have family, well, many of us have families, and yes, all of us are going in our own directions in that. So in order to go and have a sense of community, you need to have people going in the same direction. And I don't think you're going to go and see 10,000 people all going in the same direction all the time. So if you want a sense of community, I think we need to go and be a little bit more practical uh, in saying that, okay, if we get 2,000 people going in the same direction and we're doing well, um, and we may have several different groups of them going in different directions together, and that's a good thing too. Um, you don't have to have everybody do on the same plate at the same time. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Joyce. Sure, thank you. Um, so uh, I would like to see us enact some of the things that are in the Rec Department 2019 um, uh, strategic plan. So we don't have a public park in Barrington. So I feel like you could market our trails, pick up a sandwich at Kalos, but then where do you go to eat it? Well, um, the Rec Department tells me they're going to be putting picnic tables up by the the little children's playground. Um, so that's one place, but maybe we can find a trailhead that somehow can be expanded to have uh, more of a gathering place for people who wanna use those trails uh, and then uh, sit down and have a place to eat and, and, and actually stay and use some of our businesses um, in Barrington. Ever since my kids were little, there's been talk about a town beach. And I think part of that is just problematic to find the right, um, a land and spot for that. I have heard that CELT is um, going to improve the boat launch over at um, uh, the new property uh, that they acquired from the town and that there will be some access to get into the water. I doubt it will be a beach, but maybe there will be some access um, there. And I don't really know any more details um, about that. Um, but having some water access for public access in this town would be really good. Um, and You muted again, Joyce. <laughs> You're muted. Am I muted for that entire thing? No. Uh, well, for, the, for the last 15 seconds. You were, <laughs> OK. Was, was that the best part? Uh, at what point did I drop off? Well, about 15 seconds ago, just after you talked about the uh, boat launch, uh, the oh, at, fix it. No. Boat um, so I think I talked about the public, a public gathering park kind of place and the, um, the picnic tables that the rec department are going to put out, which may um, give some space for that. And then just in terms of community, we have the tricentennial coming up. And so I think that's that could be a really fun uh, thing for activities in town to bring some community and some people together. Good, thank you. OK, next question. The next question is from Carolyn Robbins. 
Hi, hey, Carolyn. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I've never spoken in a meeting before. I've never hit that unmute button. Um, <laughs> um, I have actually a two part question. The first question might seem kind of silly, but it's kind of important to me. So um, it's important to me that people who are elected officials um, believe in the system within which they work. Um, and to that end, um, also have a, a good basis in reality. So my first part of my question is um, whether you guys trust the results. I don't want your opinion on what the results were, but do you trust the results of the previous presidential election um, and believe that it was a fair election? And then the second part of my question is if you guys don't mind looking back over the past year of decisions made by the select board, um, if you have specific things that you like that they did, that you approve of, or that you disapprove of and would have handled differently, if you could address that, please. Is this for select board candidates only? Or? Yes, please, select board. All right, we'll start with Robert. Uh, thank you, Carolyn. Um, so answer to the first question. Yes, I, I do believe it was a, a fair, legitimate election and um, I do uh, hold true to the our, our democratic uh, institutions and, and believe they, they were working appropriately. Um, to the. The second part of the question. Um, one of the things that I, I, I just I want to kudos out to to Barrington and, and the, the, the select board and things that they have done in, in recent years is um, the transparency and um, the, the town website is fantastic. Uh, for those of you who have, have gone and explored the website, it is so well organized. The the, the links, the, the meetings, recordings, um, I, I'm super impressed with, with uh, the way that the town is trying to relay to its citizens in a very transparent way uh, how the town is being governed. So I think they do an excellent job with that. So thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Michael. Hello. Hello. Um, the first question uh, about the presidential re election results. Uh, unfortunately, I have to go and disagree. I do not think it was a uh, a fair and above board um, election. And I'm speaking of that based on um, my experience as a statistician. The results that were going on during the election just do not go and support um, uh, a fair election. Um, proof, there's some proof out there, but not enough for legal purposes at this time. Uh, as for the decisions of the uh, previous select board, uh, I agree with most of the ones that they've had. Um, you know, they're, they were, uh, most of the time they were in agreement with each other. Um, there were a couple of times where um, several members uh, dissented from the majority. Um, I think those were dealt with fairly uh, fairly. Um, you know, there were things, there's decisions that were gone and made uh, based on uh, some zoning and some fire department, uh, you know, um, input that, uh, you know, I think were, were actually correct. Uh, they weren't necessarily to the favor of some of the, uh, the property owners, but they, they were for uh, the general safety of the town. Um, and in some cases, there may have been other ideas that they could have gone and done uh, with property uh, disposal, but uh, by and large, I think I'd have to agree with most of the decisions that they made. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Joyce. Uh, sure. Uh, I do believe the last election was fair. And if we bring that conversation down to Barrington, we've had no concerns about the uh, the safety of our voting machines. Our voting machines are not connected to the Internet, so there's not a way that they can be hacked and that those uh, votes would not be uh, accurate. As to the second question, um, Carolyn, so I thought one of the decisions that the select board made um, 
uh, the meeting this week was the road agent proposed uh, buying a sander truck that was over the budget line for this year. Um, and he wanted one that had aluminum body because it rusts less and he felt he could get 20 years out of that truck. And so he was asking the select board to um, appropriate additional monies to buy that truck and they did buy that truck. Um, so I thought that was a, a good decision. Okay, uh, Cassie. Hey, uh, thanks for the question. Um, so as for trust of government systems, um, being a foster parent, I know that the systems in government are flawed, um, but they're what we have to work with and we, we just have to keep trying to improve them. Um, so that's kind of the, the inherent basis uh, is, do you think it's flawed? Yes. Do you think it's trustworthy? Yes. Um, and we should be improving it. Um, as to the actual um, election results, yes, I, I think that the, um, the votes are cast and that is what was um, what what people voted for. I am part of uh, conservative Christian communities and I saw the trend happening before the election results came in. A lot of people were switching parties for the first time. Um, you can if you, if you haven't seen it, you're not looking hard enough. Um, as for our uh, our select board, um, I agreed with uh, most of their decisions. Um, I like that three years ago they started recording meetings, um, putting them online. That kind of transparency is great. I have not seen wonderful clarity though, and that's really what I'm hoping to improve on is a little bit um, clarity on positions and what they want and um, and um, a little less politics. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, next question. Next question is Steve Saunders. Is your hand back up? It was lowered once and came back up. You have another question for the group? We can't hear you, Steve. Yep, you're back now. Okay, now I'm, yes, it takes a long time to unmute. Uh, since I'm using my phone. But yes, I do have another question for the uh, select board members. Um, one of the things that they've mentioned is that they'd like to find creative solutions for funding and, and supporting our services. So what I'd like them to opine on is whether they see a potential opportunity if we can get some cooperation from uh, the school board and, and the school administrators to both share services and facilities uh, with the school, uh, which might lead to economies of scale or potential use of services and, and facilities that are underutilized in either one of our, our domains. And I'd like to hear what people feel about that. Thank you, Steve. Let's start with Michael. Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, creative solutions for funding from, you know, I, I think uh, Connor actually uh, made the biggest impact this year for uh, creative solutions for funding by uh, rounding up those grants from the feds and the, and the state. Um, that definitely made a difference in our bottom line for the this year's budget. Uh, creative for the school board, and that that's tougher. Um, as you know, I, uh, I'm a little bit leery about mixing the school funding with the, uh, with the town funding. Uh, it makes it harder to go and track uh, who's actually responsible and, and where the money's coming from and how to control it. Um, now, using some of the facilities in the school, that would be great if, you, if it was a good meeting place all the time because uh, we definitely need good meeting places in this town. We don't have a lot of it. We don't have a big uh, community center. Uh, we don't have a community center period, really, uh, other than the uh, recreation department and, uh, and occasionally the library. Um, and there's no, pl there's no place in the, uh, in the new town hall for that either. Um, other, other services, I think we're already going and sharing uh, some of our uh, grounds maintenance equipment with uh, uh, 
between the school and the uh, and the graveyard. So, you know that that's happening now. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we'll confuse you a little and go backwards here. Robert, you're next. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Saunders. Um, I, I am I am totally open to creative solutions, and um, you know, in in my my career, I have often had to explore outside of the box uh, uh, ways of, of approaching uh, problems, and and whether it be shared split positions in personnel or uh, shared equipment. Um, there's a lot of um, efficiencies that can be had from things that are uh, redundant, and so um, I don't necessarily know exactly how. Um, the town might draw the line between what the, the municipal and school budgets allow, but um, I certainly think that efficiencies could be had if, if people work together as a team. So I, I would be in support of that. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, um, so as for um, sharing school um, properties, I'm not in support of any kind of um, shared space because I feel like we need to keep our kids safe and by keeping them um, separate and the school um, locations locked down when they're not in use, I think that's an important piece of keeping our kids safe. Um, so I, I would agree that you know sharing um, lawn maintenance and things like that are, are wonderful, but I don't feel like we can move to a shared um, uh, community inside of the schools. Um, I'm trying to remember the other half of the question now. Uh, can you give me a hint? <laughs> I think it was a two part. Uh, Creative solutions for funding and that's uh, what it was. All right. Yeah, yep. so um, I feel like a pay per point is a good way to get funding. So I know a lot of people come into our library and pay to use it um, from out of the town. And I think as we grow other sources like that, um, one thing I haven't mentioned is I would love to actually see a skate park in our town, which I'd have to feel out to see how many people would support that. Um, I was a skateboarder and I would love to see that in our town, but that's a way to actually generate revenue by having people come in and pay for using it. Um, that's all. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Kelsey. Uh, Joyce. Sure. Hi. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, in general, cooperation between the departments sounds um, like a very good principle. Um, I don't know what kind of RSAs might um, outline what we can and can't do in terms of cooperation. Um, uh, we do know with sharing the school's library with the public library in town that there are some problematic issues with that. Um, for one, just schools are only open between, you know, what, eight and three. So they're not being staffed um, beyond that. They're not there on weekends, evenings. Um, so I know that um, the Barrington Foundation and the trustees have looked at that issue, whether there could be a library that's placed in the schools and there are just too many barriers to um, making that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Uh, Chief Walker. Thank you for the opportunity to speak again. This is a question for the four select board candidates. Um, I'm a huge proponent of uh, shared services, uh, have been uh, for all, all of uh, a long time and mainly even back when I was on the school board because I think sharing services um, makes a dollar go a little bit further. Along that lines, I personally am a proponent of having a uh, combined budget committee in which um, there would be a number of budget committee members that would be selected from the town side, a number that would be selected from the school side. And the reason I believe this works well is because that these people could sit and look at the big picture, not not separating the town and the dollars for that, and separate the school and the dollars for that and warrant articles. They could take a, a, a look at the big picture. So. I ask all you candidates, are you a proponent or would you consider supporting um, a, uh, a combined budget committee like we had years ago? Thank you. Thanks, Rick. We'll start with Robert. 
Um, I would support that. I think that sounds like a good idea. It's a very holistic approach, and I think that you, when you, when you can step back and see the the whole picture as a committee, you, you can. It, it's better than working in silos. I, I, I would agree that that would be a good idea. Thank you, uh, Kathy. That's something I haven't really considered, and I honestly would want to think about it on all directions before I gave an answer. Um, I'm someone that likes to research and dig in, and I'm not prepared to answer for that unless I had more information. Thank you. Joyce? Sure. Um, I would be open to looking at that. Um, like Cassie, I want to know all the pros and cons of that. I want to know, since we've had some past experience with that, how well that worked, how well it didn't. Um, but I would certainly be open to that conversation. I know there's been some conversations about why do we have a, a separate day for the a town deliberative session and then a separate day for the school budget. Why don't we have those in a combined day? And I don't think that conversation has gone very far and I'm not sure uh, what, are, what have been all the pros and cons about that. A con possibly could be it would be a very long day. Um, but I'm hoping to looking at that. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Michael. That's interesting that uh, that we had previously had a combined budget committee and that uh, considering how uh, complex the uh, the current town budget is, uh, adding the school budget into that almost makes my head want to explode. <laughs> the uh, but if it worked back then and it's working in other communities, I think we, it's something we could go and, and revisit and see whether or not it does go and work better or for us or not. Um, you know, I don't see, again, it, it's like uh, Joyce says, we need more information, I think, on that to go and, and make any kind of decision on it. But it's definitely worth looking at. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Next question. Next question I have is from Jessica Tennis. Hi, Jess, go ahead. All right, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> my name is Jessica Tennis, and I am a resident of Barrington as well as the town's recreation director. Uh, as you can imagine, recreation is very important to me, and I believe that it is a vital um, part of the community. My question for each of you is, what are your thoughts on the role that recreation plays within the community as well as the importance of that role? And this is for select board candidates. Yes, I'm sorry for not clarifying it. <laughs> okay, I'm just trying to drum up some questions for our other two people that are uh, down here not answering much. But anyway, okay, we'll start with Cassie on this one. So I think the rec center and the rec department is very important to establishing our community. Um, I think the ski program and um, uh, brings together not just kids but adults. Um, the well, there's tons of adults program at the rec center, but um, I I absolutely love the community that it it um, it creates. One aspect that I do worry a little bit about is the before and after school care and how it's not available to every resident. That it's only some residents that. Um, are first in line and at least historically in the past it's been that way um, and that's something that I'd like to look farther into that we can find a solution where it's um, it's something that can uh, can be available to everyone who needs it and um, at an appropriate price point um, yeah and I'd love to expand yeah. some of them, some of it into um, parks and other like a skate park, like a public park. So there's there's some dreamy things out there that we'd have to put it on paper and see what they actually look like. But I would love to expand our rec and support them a bit more. Thank you, Joyce. Um, so uh, the goal of recreation and making recreation more part of people's lives in Barrington, um, it, I think, is just an awesome goal. It, it certainly fits with my. Um, healthcare background of uh, prevention and wanting to keep people healthy. So having the programming um, that you're doing and could uh, expand with, I think is a really valuable uh, thing for our community. Um, the question about the pre and post um, school programs, I'm sure that's limited by capacity of staff and, um, and the building. 
and and that aging infrastructure uh, that you have. Um, I know you have a vision for um, various things in Barrington, and I hope that we can uh, help you move a few steps forward in that vision. Thank you. Thanks, Joyce. Michael. Well, the recreation department is. Uh, am I getting an echo? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not really big on using the recreation department myself. Um, you know, we've done and used it in the past with various other groups like the Cub Scouts and the Boy Scouts. Um, as far as um, actual, uh, you know, usage, I, I look at that space that they have there. It's not adequate in that for you know certain types of sports. For instance, the uh, you know your basketball court area is not a full, not a, a full size legal court, for instance, in that. So, you know, it, playing a, a real game of basketball in there is is not exactly practical. Um, does that mean that we need to expand it? Uh, probably. Um, the question is, is when can we afford to go and do that? And how badly do, do the people in the town uh, want to go and do that? So I would have to go and defer to their judgment on that. Thank you. Thank you. And our next, uh, oh, Robert. Yep, sorry, you need to overlook it. No worries. Um, to answer your question, I, I, yes, I believe recreation does have a role and, and plays an important role in um, our community. Um, I have a similar background to Joyce, uh, and so immediately what came to mind was was some of the health benefits that come with recreation. And so when we look at what makes a healthy community, a resilient community, um, we can't look past health. And, and so um, that and, and, and any of the work that you're doing with uh, connecting people back to nature, your outdoor classrooms and things like that, I, I'm a big proponent of that. Um, I think um, some of our younger generations have, have really unfortunately lost touch with with our the outdoors and um, and, and I think the recreation is a great way to come together uh, in those venues. So thank you. Thank you. OK, your next question. Jack Gale. Oh, yes, good evening. Um, the town of Barrington and all towns in New Hampshire only thrive and, and are real, truly beautiful beyond the trees and lakes. Um, because of the people that volunteer. To all six of you that are running, uh, if you could comment on how do we motivate our community members to step up, maybe like you are at the, the higher offices, or even to participate in some of the civic organizations that we have that make this town a much better place. Thanks, Jack. We'll start with Joyce. You're muted, Joyce. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is I've been standing at the transfer station um, campaigning, and when people pull over and talk to me and they, they're really, the voice is rising about a certain issue, I say, you certainly have a lot of passion. What are you doing to volunteer in, in the town? Um, so that's been a little way of planting that seed uh, for people that we, we uh, towns run on volunteers. Um, that's the, the way it is. Uh, but I think just reaching out to people in our network, sometimes I think people don't think of it until someone asks and say, did you ever consider running for you know, whatever. Um, so I think it behooves all of us um, to just keep uh, that question foremost as we're talking to people in town. Thanks, Jack. Thank you, Virginia. <laughs> you still here, Jenna? <laughs> I don't see her user uh, still in here, Ron. All right, she's disappeared. Okay, how about Chelsea? You'll have to unmute yourself if you're still with us, Ms. Fitzgerald. Hi, I'm here, sorry. I didn't think anybody there wanted to talk to me. <laughs> 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 to be honest, I had to move rooms and I'm watching kids, it's all. 
We're getting really close to the Bruins. I'm sorry. Can we re repeat the question? It was about volunteerism and, and what um, you will do to help promote volunteerism, citizen engagement in the community. What ideas you have? Oh, my goodness. This is like my OK, we're going to go into like work talk right now. So I am a big component of word of mouth networking. It's 2022. Um, that's really kind of how things get done. I think we need to embrace um, that whole aspect. I think I hate to say like Facebook's evil in the sense of, you know, Facebook being evil. But it's a great tool to get that kind of message across with volunteering. Um, there's, you're gonna hear a lot of background noise in a minute. Um, so that is definitely a big component for me for that. I also believe that we are in a sense that Barrington is spread out in a big area, but we are kind of condensed in the sense of where our social you know, gatherings can be. So I definitely see flyers are still a great thing. I love the aspect of putting stuff at the corner where Caleb's is, where 125, where you see everything. I think that's another great spot for that. So that's kind of in where I see that aspect happening the most. Um, and it also depends on what kind of volunteering it is. Are we talking about school age or older? So there's definitely a lot of different things to have that kind of work out. Okay. Thank you. Virginia, you're back. Would you like to answer that question? Huh. Sure. I I was I was there, but I was listening on my phone because I was having some technical issues. So oh, okay. right. I feel feel like um, volunteering is a great way to build community in the town before people were talking about how to build community. And I think getting word of mouth from person to person, like I got involved in the trails committee. I wanted to be outdoors. I've met so many great people on the trails committee. It has helped me get to know people better in town. And I think any volunteering that people do in town, they don't realize that that's a side benefit of just uh, building the community. And so I guess for me, it's just talking to other people and inviting them to be a part of something that I think that they would be a good fit for. Good, thank you, Michael. Well, uh, when I uh, ran for select board last year and, and failed to go and, and get enough votes in that, uh, the opportunity came about for me to go and volunteer, to go and be a member of the budget committee. And I jumped on it. It was like, and this, it was an eye opener. It was definitely an education experience. And it, uh, you know, it feels, um, like I should have gone and done that a long time ago. Um, that's the sort of thing that, you know, I wish more people in the town would go and do. We've got, you know, 70 some people in that listening now that are interested enough to actually show up and listen. Uh, I would reach out to you and say that we have over a half a dozen different uh, volunteer groups that you can go and join to go and help make this uh, town better. And I uh, would go and encourage you to do so. Um, I, I look at the uh, the people who are volunteered to uh, run for office, and I'm a little disappointed that many of these particular positions are going um, uncontested. Uh, there have been times in, in years past where we've actually seen nobody go and run for some positions, and that that's very discouraging. And you know, we can't make the place better unless we do go and step up. So please do so. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Robert. Um, serving on a, a variety of, of regional and, and national um, groups that are that are run largely by volunteer uh, members. Uh, you know, this has been a problem that has been growing for, for years now and, and getting uh, engagement and participation is really difficult. Um, one thing I know a lot of organizations are trying to do is, is really encourage the younger generations, um, you know, to to become more engaged. Perhaps there are opportunities uh, with the school board to, you know, uh, figure out ways that the, the school curricula and stuff can help 
foster more community involvement and engagement uh, with our, our younger people. Um, and then again, as a select board, as a municipality, supporting places where people come together, um, uh, things like a library, things like recreation and such, I think as supporting those in that infrastructure uh, will also help to foster uh, more engagement and community involvement. Thank you, Cassie. So uh, what came to my, my mind immediately was uh, my daughter has required service hours at Co Brown, and that's something that I would like to see in um, Barrington, um, perhaps not at uh, such a challenging level for as high schoolers, but I think it's true that if we bring in the younger kids, um, their parents will follow and it'll be easier to see um, how much the town needs us and how easy it is to volunteer. Um, I, I like some of the grassroots things. There's a Don't Trash Barrington Facebook group, which is cleaning up the roads. Um, but I'd like to see the town um, advertise things and um, move to meet a demographic which is primarily virtual, um, that isn't traditionally involved um, in government. And that would be, you know, parents with young kids, um, single people moving in, um, you know, uh, the groups that are a little less involved. Um, I want to see if we can um, harness the tools, the media that they use. Um, that's that's something I would like to see. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one more question for the town candidates, because then uh, right. we'll give them a chance to do a little wrap up. Mr. Moderator, there's three hands still up. Two have asked questions before and one is new. Are you comfortable with taking one new question or new question asker? Yeah. Yes. Okay, Jackie Silly. Hi, thank you. I'm, I'm unmuted, aren't I? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So, um, so thank you all for stepping up. This question actually is for all of the candidates. Um, our town budget and our school budget relies at least in part on grants that we get from um, or, or shared revenues that we get from the state and or the federal government. Um, you know, when I think of uh, things like roads and bridges and dams, um, much of that uh, is facilitated or, or um, assisted by state uh, grants. Um, for the school, for example, we get, you know, we get state monies um, from a wide variety of sources, the lottery and so on. Um, in this past, uh, you know, year, the legislature uh, funded um, far more private uh, they, vouchers, really, for the schools than um, had been uh, projected to be the case. So all of those monies that go someplace else are monies that don't come to our town. And I guess my question is, um, how would you advocate for getting the full benefit of the grants that are supposed to be coming our way from these, you know, from these sources. Thanks, Jackie. We'll start with Michael. Well, like I said earlier, um, Connor, uh, our uh, town administrator, um, has done a pretty good job of going and picking up uh, federal and state grants for the, the town budget. Um, obviously, he can't go and do that for the, uh, the school. Uh, that would be up to the school board and, and how they go and, and solicit that information. Uh, that, for those funds, I'm, uh, you know, it's our tax taxes that went and made those funds in the first place. They need to come back to us um, but they need to come back to us with outgoing and making all kinds of stipulations and requirements on us. Uh, you know, handing over a hundred dollars to some bureaucrat down in Washington, D.C., who then goes and decides that you have to stand on your head and, and recite the Pledge of Allegiance just to go and get the money back. That doesn't make sense. Um, if you go and you get the money back and it's distributed because they want to go and make it fair, okay, I can see that. But realistically, um, 
people like like Connor, like the school board, um, they should go and look at that and take the uh, take what money that they can, and you know leave the decision whether it's worth worthwhile making you know, putting up with the stipulations to um, the members of the board like myself and that. And we would have to look at that on a case by case basis. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Robert. Thanks, Jackie. Um, certainly there, there are a lot of opportunities, uh, state and federal uh, monies, and uh, there are a lot of different people charged with going after and trying to advocate uh, for that. And uh, certainly it's it's a lot of work. And um, uh, I, I agree that um, our, our town administration seems to do a really great job um, trying to be resourceful um, and, and make sure that we're getting our um, the money that that we're uh, that's coming to us i think that um we, we really need to be able to engage our elected officials at the state and federal level our our, our representative senators and congress people um to make sure that they are going to bat um uh to uh get the funding that exists or or new funding that um they can advocate for so if we can engage with them um that will help us a lot thank you kathy So I might have a lot more to say about this than others. Um, so I have homeschooled my kids um, over the past uh, 15 years, um, depending on the child and the age in school. Um, so I've been following this, um, what you're calling a voucher program very closely. Um, in my opinion, when we pay our tax money in, we should be able to use it again. And what was frustrating to me as a taxpayer was my kids were going to or being homeschooled, but I was still paying tax money for the public schools, but unable to access a lot of their resources like textbooks until I was in my kids were in the public schools and then they were able to give them back to me. Um, and so sometimes it's frustrating where I would pay a thousand dollars for um, materials at home. And then my public school kids would come home and half of their workbooks weren't done. And I know how much those workbooks cost. Um, so to me, um, I, I'm completely fine with the voucher program. Um, it is putting tax money back to where it should be, which is with the students that is using it. Um, as for um, the broader picture, Sununu, Governor Sununu um, um, today said that we should be pushing back on the town leaders um, to reduce our taxes. And so I'm actually foreseeing a bit more pushback um, coming because uh, I, I wonder if that means fewer grants are coming um, based on what he had announced. Um, I think we're going to have to see where that comes from. But um, in the end, grants aren't free. Grants are our tax money coming back to us. Um, so you have Thanks, to look Kathy. at it a little bit like that. Thanks. Hey, Joyce. You're muted, Joyce. <laughs> Thanks, Fran. I think as a single select board member, you know, I don't carry a whole lot of weight, um, but I think as a select board of a, as a group, if we can put um, pressure on our elected officials, uh, that creates more of a statement. Um, I don't know if it's been done, but working with select boards in other communities, so you have more of a block of people who are saying to Concord, you know, we need to get um, these monies um, coming locally. Um, and I don't know how much the New Hampshire Municipal Association does in terms of advocacy, um, but that's something I would want to learn about and see how, if, if they do do some advocacy, how we can encourage um, our select board to use that avenue. And I do think perhaps Connor's uh, chair of that at this moment, correct? So thank you. I'm sure you at some point can give us some background on that. Okay, thank you. Virginia, would you like to weigh in on this one? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll just make a statement and just say that um, as a former public school librarian, um, every penny of Virginia, you're breaking up. We, we can't hear you well. <laughs> Sorry, um, but I'm having technical issues. Can you that hear me better. now? That sounds better. Okay. 
Um, um, so I that taking my well, students we, who are we can't hear you now, Virginia. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Do you have something you can fix or me now? Yeah, I think uh, we can hear you. You can. So far. So, okay. uh, I, I think I'm better. As, as, uh, my, my technology is not working well. Mm -hmm. I think she said she's ready to move on, Mr. St. Jean. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Chelsea, would you like to answer this one? I I mean, I, oh, I don't know if my camera's, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, I don't think my camera is the most important part, some of the mic, but um, I will have to say that I am not for uh, the voucher program at all, um, only because I can see what happens when there is too much in the bias as to what needs to be handed out to help people. Um, so that's kind of my personal opinion on, on that, though I do see the need to be responsible in the sense of fiscal responsibility. However, that is a line that should be kind of looked at in the sense of, are we not giving what we need to people that need it just because of a couple cents to a dollar? So that's my personal thought process on that. Okay, thank you. Well, everybody, uh, you've all heard a bunch of questions tonight and you have some idea of what people are interested in. Uh, let's just wrap up with maybe a 30 second statement each just kind of summarizing uh, how you feel about what you've heard tonight and and if it's changed your perspective at all and uh, we'll just do a real quick quick round starting at the top with Joyce. Sure. Pat. Well, I want to thank to the, uh, the three other people who are running for select board because I think it's always really good to have a diversity of opinion. Uh, and and that's just part of a democracy. And it's great that we have uh, several people running for at least select board and many more for school board. Um, oh, oh, and I noticed at one point we had up to 122 people on this uh, Zoom call. And so that's just amazing. That's also just democracy in action. So we perhaps want to keep that in mind when we're scheduling future. Um, candidate forums that we have uh, a much greater amount of participation when we do it virtually. So thanks everyone who attended and for asking questions. Thank you, Cassie. All right, thanks everyone who's uh, attended and asked questions and thank you. Um, um, I. Uh, I just want to wrap up by saying that I do plan to focus on tapping into our community by um, supporting the spaces we use to meet and play and collaborate. Um, and that I would be very happy to work with any of the other candidates I see um, uh, willingness to collaborate. And uh, it, it seems like we do have a good group of candidates running and I'm, I'm glad to be one of them. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. I agree with what Cassie was just saying. I, I think there's uh, lots of opportunity to bridge divides. I think that we all have um, a lot in, in common uh, in, in, the, in the best interest of, of Barrington. And so, um, you know, we live in a really uh, complex and, and changing world. And in order for our town to stay resilient and, and, and able to respond and adapt, um, it's going to take teamwork and we all need to be able to work together and build consensus and come to um, decisions that are made with foresight uh, for the future and for our future generations in the town that we're going to leave them. So I look forward to an opportunity to to serve the town um, and I want to uh, be known as someone who listens. And so if you see me out and about, please come talk to me. I would love to hear what your concerns are and what we can do better. Thank you, Robert. Michael. Robert's correct. Uh, you know, most of the job of a select board member is to go and be an ear to the community. Um, none of us can individually make decisions. Uh, that is uh, the responsibility of the board as a whole. Um, that's why we go and we have meetings every two weeks in that to go and make these decisions. 
Um, but we do go and have input to those boards. Um, I think that I will go and do a very good job of going and representing the interests of the people of this town. And I ask you to go and give me the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Chelsea? Oh, okay. Got the mic first. Um, it was honestly, I just want to say thank you for allowing this kind of it's 2022. Everything's on Teams or Zoom right now. So it might not have been the forum that probably everybody wanted and everything like that. But I think this whole thing went really smoothly for the most part. And honestly, if there anybody has questions, they can probably find me social media somewhere. And I'd be happy to answer any questions, follow up questions they might have. I know I wasn't really asked a lot because I don't think there was probably too much to ask me. But if there's any other questions, I'd be happy to help. Okay, uh, Virginia, you trust your technology to try uh, one last time here? Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, well, thanks everyone for participating and I'm happy to have the opportunity to listen to the concerns and ideas presented and um, um, I look forward to doing more work, volunteer work in the town. Okay, thank you. Thank you all of you for participating tonight and, and uh, most of all for uh, getting yourselves involved in uh, potential positions that are going to take a lot of your time over the next few years. So, uh, you know, thanks for doing that and uh, stay engaged. We're real happy to have you. Uh, so now we'll move along to the uh, school board candidates. Where I, I see some of them here anxious to get going. Uh, we have seven people running for two seats for three-year terms. Uh, two of them are incumbents, and five are folks that are new to these positions. So uh, we will give each of them, uh, start, you know, kind of going in alphabetical order, uh, two minutes for an opening statement, and then we'll get to questions. So we'll start with uh, Adam. Are you here, Adam Duguay? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, I can't seem to get my uh, video to work. Um, so, so my name is Adam Dugan. I've been a Barrington resident since 2016. Those who know me will tell you that my life revolves around my wife and three children. I've been a licensed electrician in New Hampshire for eight years, doing construction for about 12 now a 13 year veteran for the United States Army Reserve. Sorry, United States Army. I've been a baseball coach in Barrington since I, I moved in 2016. Um, I've been lucky enough to win a championship with my kids as well as almost win one. And I'm a current student at SNHU in Hooksett. <clears throat> And I am obviously I'm running for the school board. And um, I think that's all I have for my introduction. Thank you. OK, thank you, Adam. Uh, Gaffer Fitch. Hi, my name is Gaffer Fitch. I'm running for school board uh, because I care about our children, care about our town of Barrington. Been here about 14 years and I care about our country as a whole. Um, all in all, I love growth. I love watching and even helping people improve to become better. This is especially true for children. Uh, watching a child try, fail, try again, and ultimately persevere. That look in their face when they finally get it, you know, like when a kid finally triumphs and knows that they've leveled up, there's nothing like that. Um, while growing up, I attended a Camp Sergeant in Merrimack as a camper for many years, then a CIT counselor in training for a year, and then an actual counselor for a few more. Uh, again, going along with uh, educating and helping kids come up. These days, my focus is on my own two children, uh, Zelia, who's in sixth grade, and Jordan, who's in fourth. Through them, I've coached soccer a few times, assistant coach T-ball. I'm active in uh, Cub Scouts, having run the Pinewood Derby, the technical side of that this year, and the last year we did it. Uh, to me, there's nothing more important than preparing the next generation for the world awaiting them. It's good for our children, it's good for Barrington, it's good for the country. Um, I decided to run because I was asked to, uh, after discussing the position with others, including my teacher wife, Shannon, I realized my skill sets are a good fit. I have a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy, a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering, and I have an MBA with a PMP certification. 
Uh, my job is I'm a principal site reliability engineer, and I work for places like Dyne in Manchester, TripAdvisor near Boston, and Tumblr in New York City. Uh, currently, I work out of Austin, Texas for a company called Core Scientific, which mines Bitcoin. I also about half the time served as a manager in these positions, at one point managing four teams at once. So with my skill set fitting, my job is to take grand visions from the C-levels and the VPEs and execute them. I start with defining which, what success looks like and how to measure it. And then I break things up, the big project into chunks and then hand them out. And that way we can both um, uh, get the work handed out and actually manage up well, showing progress on the project day by day. Um, and then uh, what I'll do from a technical end is I'll build tools to help people do their jobs, make their jobs go faster and faster, saving time and money. Um, and that's, I found that's this time. That's about okay. time. Okay. Good enough. Thank you. Get back to you shortly. Uh, Ken Grant, are you here? We have if Ken. you're participating on a phone, you might have to press star six to unmute yourself. Okay. Not seeing anything on mine, Mr. Moderator. Okay. Uh, let's move along to uh, Frank Natali. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. All right. So, uh, good evening, everyone, and I'd like to uh, thank Ron and Connor for putting this forum together. Um, I've already told Ron earlier. Um, I was actually in the hospital earlier today under anesthesia, uh, so I'm still feeling pretty loopy and groggy. And my doctor actually told me not to even bother participating in this forum tonight. Um, However, to be fair to everyone viewing and to the other candidates, I want to at least make an opening statement um, and hopefully uh, there'll be an in-person school board uh, forum sometime in early March uh, where I can address questions from the public in person. Um, I will be watching this recording as soon as it's available and answering the questions uh, that the uh, citizens pose to the other candidates tonight. And you can find that on um, Facebook. Uh, if you look for Frank Natale for Barrington School Board, uh, you should be able to find it there. Um, so with that, my name is Frank Natale and I'm running for school board here in Barrington. I'm a father of three. My two oldest uh, attend BMS and my youngest is still at home uh, learning her ABCs. Uh, I've been a research scientist for over 22 years now and I've been involved in education programs ranging from elementary school age to uh, graduate level courses. I've managed labs, written and maintained budgets and have co-authored several peer-reviewed papers. Uh, I'm running for school board to be an advocate for uh, the parents, um, the taxpayers, and most importantly, the children of our community. Uh, before moving our family to Barrington, my wife and I, um, uh, several years ago, our primary goal was to look for um, a good a community with a good uh, education system. And because Barrington was at that top of the list, that's this is why we've settled here. Uh, unfortunately, um, in looking at the I report on the New Hampshire Department of Education website, it looks like um, our district proficiency, especially in English, math, and science, have been in decline. Uh, not too bad. English and math around around 45% and science proficiency at like 39%. Um, I think we should strive for better. Uh, and while I understand COVID and remote learning pose some serious problems uh, our, to our great teachers and staff, um, these declines had been already trending downward before the lockdowns. Uh, I really think the next school board should school board should prioritize increasing these scores. Uh, we need to take a closer look at the curriculum and find where these adjustments and improvements can be made. Uh, now, I'm originally from New Jersey, um, one of the highest property tax states in the country, and they spend a tremendous amount of money on public education um, and their schools are still failing. So I can tell you that throwing money at the problem fixes nothing. Uh, we need to make sure that we are using our resources effectively and efficiently while um, providing our teachers and uh, the proper tools and resources that they need. Um, and most importantly, maintaining proper communication and generating feedback from the parents. Um, okay, that's, that's parental time. involvement is, uh, is really essential. Um, I wanna thank all the other candidates. And again, I, I apologize for having to jump off after this. Um, uh, you can find me on Frank Natale for Barrington School Board on Facebook, or you can email me your questions directly at Frank4, that's the number four, uh, frank4schoolboard at gmail.com. I thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you, Frank. Uh, Carrie Neal. Hello, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. 
Uh, thank you, Connor and Ron, for running um, and moderating this event. Everyone who's here in attendance, as well as uh, my fellow candidates. I've lived in Barrington for more than 10 years, and I'm very happy that I've gotten to raise um, and continue to raise our three children here. Um, why I'm here running for re-election to serve the school board is because I'm truly passionate about education and community um, to my core. I've dedicated the last 10 years of my life to being fully committed um, to the educational community within this town, uh, from students um, and their families to to the staff as well. Uh, serving, serving the community through this passion is part of who I am. And I, I realize that, that probably sounds like lip service to some folks, but what I mean when I say I'm dedicated is that it's not a hobby, it's not a fleeting idea or a temporary soapbox. It truly really is a lifelong commitment um, that I've dedicated myself to and a trust that the community has in me um, and a belief that every child and family in it deserve to have every educational opportunity and the best supports made available to them. I also believe in supporting academic achievement through supporting our educators holistically, as well as continuing to represent Barrington at the legislative level. Um, I sincerely hope to earn your vote to continue to serve the schools and the community for another term. Thank you. Thanks, Kerry. Uh, Moira Taylor. Hi, thank you, Ron and Connor, for organizing this. Um, I originally ran for school board years ago um, as a way to serve my community. Um, I've been an educator for over 25 years. I was a special educator for over 20 years. Uh, I have a master's in education, and so um, I looked to a way that I could use that skill set in serving the community, and the school board um, made sense for me. I appreciate um, that uh, people um, have differing opinions and I've served with, you know, a lot of different board members and I, you know, I've come to value that, well, we may not always look at things the same way and having different perspectives on the board is a, a great value. Working towards a consensus um, has been something that has been a consistent in those years and I appreciate that. Um, I you know, come from a family that does do a lot of volunteering in town. My husband was a long-term scoutmaster and is an assistant scoutmaster now. My son volunteers for the fire department. So certainly our, you know, family ethic is to give back to the community. And that's why I choose to serve on the board and hope to continue to do so. Thanks, Moira. Jenny Wilson. <clears throat> Good evening. This is Jenny Wilson right here. Um, good evening to everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to address the um, the other candidates. And uh, thank you to Connor and uh, Ron St. Jean for giving me this uh, opportunity to introduce myself. My name is Jenny Wilson and I've been a, a resident of New Hampshire for about 24 years. Um, I lived in Exeter for 15, 15 years where my kids uh, graduated from high school. Both of my kids, I have two sons. They went to school in, New, in uh, UNH and uh, Keene State. They're graduates from those two universities. As for me, um, I grew up in Puerto Rico, born in New York. And in Puerto Rico, I got my education, my bachelor's degree in English joined the Air Force uh, as an Air Force officer. And um, when we get back to the United States, I went back to school, get my minor in Spanish. Um, when we were in Pennsylvania, I worked uh, at a private school teaching Spanish. And I also have done uh, tutoring in Spanish. So I'm very passionate about education. And that's the reason why I'm running for the school board. Uh, education, it has always been one of my biggest and highest priorities. Um, so I am looking forward to serving my community, getting to know the people that live here and teach my our children. And that's the reason why I am running. It's, uh, it's an opportunity for me now that I am retired to spend uh, extra time, you know, getting to know my neighbors, uh, the teachers, uh, the school, the system. And um, when I put my heart into something, I give it my 100%. Okay, thank Thanks. you. Yeah. All right. Uh, has Ken appeared uh, anywhere yet? Ken. 
I don't see Ken Grant anywhere on the list yet, so. No, Mr. Moderator gave a call um, and it doesn't sound like he was trying to get on. I want to make sure he wasn't having technical difficulties. OK. All right, so we will continue on with questions and we will uh, give everybody about a minute and a half, I would say. We were going to do less, but uh, since there's fewer of you now, we can do a minute and a half. So uh, do we have any questions ready to go? Yep, first hand up comes from Cecil Mulholland. Okay, what's your question? Yeah, hi, uh, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Yes, thanks. I appreciate this forum. Uh, I have to admit that prior to COVID, I was not uh, involved much, and I'm, I'm now taking uh, a higher notice of what's going on, and uh, I really do appreciate the opportunity to ask a question. Um, my question is, do you feel that masking has a negative impact on children? And would you vote yes or no today to make the masking optional? Thank you. Okay, we will start with Gaffer. You have a minute and a half if you want. Gaffer, go ahead. So the question was, if, is masking having a negative impact? Yes, it is. It's having a negative impact, but a much smaller impact than not masking. Um, the the gain we get from masking is all about protecting our children's right to education. Uh, the more masks we have, or the more people that are masked, the less likely our kids are to get sick, or the rate at which they get sick will be less. That we're less likely to overwhelm the hospitals. Uh, therefore, yeah, wearing a mask is a pain in the butt. Kids don't like it. It's that's, that's absolutely true. But the it's a greater pain in the butt, you could say, to end up in the hospital, to have the cl school close, and to have our kids not be able to get a good education. That's my answer. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you for that yeah. question, and and thank you for being uh, as involved as you've been in the past. And I think, regardless of what the reasons are, I think it's always good to be involved um, with the school board, especially when you're having children in school with us. Um, what I'm happy about is that, well actually no, first I'll answer, do I think masks have a negative impact? Um, I think Gaffer said it pretty well. I don't think any child wakes up in the morning and is excited about wearing a mask. I don't think there's been um, sufficient long-term studies to show exactly what damage it's been, but I'm sure that it has a negative effect in some way. It's not their normal. Um, and I know we're all hungry to get back to normal. So there's that. Um, secondly, I don't have I, the numbers right in front of me, but I understand that they are trending down. And so if they are trending down, according to what the uh, mask matrices states, as I've stated in other school board meetings, that that's what I'm following, then that's what I'll support. If it's low, then, let, then let's follow that, that guide because that's what we've committed to. Um, and that's what I believe in. And so, and I believe that they're getting close to that if they're not already there, which is great news. Um, and I hope that they continue to trend down because I know we're all getting tired of it. Um, and so I, I'm very hopeful for the future and for the future vote. Thank you, Moira. Hi, thank you for the question. Um, so, you know, you've been following the school board, so you clearly have seen my previous votes. And um, I too am following the data, and I was very excited to see that, you know, the positivity rate for Stratford County is under 10%. Um, that's one of our metrics. Um, certainly, I um, support, you know, getting, removing the masks and making them optional yet recommended um, as uh, soon as possible. And I think with spring coming and being able to open windows and things like that are all making it much more likely to happen in the very near future. Um, I do think, well, um, you know, there's a lot of theories about the negative effects of um, mask wearing. Um, I'm not aware of any peer reviewed studies that demonstrate those negative effects. Um, and there are peer reviewed studies that demonstrate the efficacy of mask use. Um, I do um, work in three elementary schools. So I see children wearing masks, hundreds and hundreds of them. And um, I think for a lot of them, it's not so bothersome. Um, I do recall when schools on, on a widespread measure had to close. And I think that was much more emotionally devastating for children to be isolated and not be able to be with their friends. And so as I've said publicly in meetings, 
I would like to do everything we can to make sure that we keep our schools open and have as many of our kids attending as possible. Um, and that is the ultimate goal is to make sure that they're there and with their friends. You know, I appreciate that there are opportunities during the day, such as snack, lunch, recess, PE is optional. They have mask breaks, so they do have opportunities to be without masks. I, I am excited that it looks like the light at the end of the tunnel is these masks can go away and I'm hopeful for that as soon as possible. Okay, thanks Moira. Uh, Jenny? Yes, I think that um, when it comes to masking our children, um, I personally don't um, agree with that. I think that kids are more resilient than we give them credit. So I would say I would leave it up to the parents um, if they if they feel that the, their child should wear a mask, um, you know, give the parent the authority to make that decision. Uh, I grew up uh, when, you know, uh, running barefoot and jumping in the river and stuff like that. And we all get a little cold here and there, but I don't think that um, we should make the kids wear a mask. I think it does have a negative impact. And even, you know, a teacher trying to teach the children and you can't even see what she's saying. Her lips are just, they can't even see the lips. So yeah, I think that it, there is a negative impact on wearing masks. And I I would leave it up to the parents if, if I had that power. Obviously I don't, but that's my opinion. Thank you. Hey, Adam? Yes. So if you guys have been watching school board meetings, you'll see that I've been there and uh, I've uh, I've recently served the school board with a notice of maladministration and notice and uh, a sworn affidavits of maladministration for their violations of their oaths that they took when uh, swearing in as government officials. Uh, so I do not believe in mass for a number of reasons. I would I would gladly contest uh, what Moria said, Miss Taylor. Excuse me, I apologize. Apologize if I said your name wrong. Uh, I would I would contest that um, there are peer review studies showing that masks don't work, not only now but prior to to COVID nineteen. So um, I disagree with with many statements saying that. And and we know that <clears throat> if if you're willing to look at the information, you can see what what kind of part articles exit different kinds of mass. There has been there has been studies and clinical tests, and and we we hear a lot that the water the water droplets uh, contain contain particles. Well, most masks do not do not. Uh, stop particles that on the average size of 60 microns. So I don't want to go into it, but I, I have looked into to much of these studies. And and one thing I want to Adam, time's up point out is the school board has not. Adam, Adam, I'm sorry. That's OK. That's thank you. Thank you. That's OK. We'll I'm sure I'll you. get back to him. But. We'll get back to you for sure. OK, uh, next question. Next question I have is from a user, Leisters. Okay. Hi, thank you so much. This is uh, the Listers. Um, my question right. for the school board candidates for this evening. Um, if you were elected, um, what is your plan beyond attending school board meetings to connect with the educational community in Barrington? Okay, we'll start with Carrie. Sure, thank you for that question. Um, I have a history of being in the schools very often. I mean, maybe not as much with COVID, but I think physically being there, seeing what the schools are, are looking like, the classrooms, um, being part of those conversations with teachers, being active in the day-to-day -day is really important. Um, being part of the committees that school boards are part of, include staff, and I think really giving them an opportunity to speak, listening to them, truly deeply listening to what they're saying, their experiences are, and giving them that um, platform to be able to help us together collaboratively make a difference is crucial. Um, I also believe community outreach and transparency about 
new programs that are running, new initiatives that are running, talking about how we are achieving our strategic goals is hugely important as well. Um, that communication factor is key. Um, and then I also believe just getting out there and volunteering in events and community events, even outside the school, because the children are also outside of the school um, and being part of talking to families in atmospheres that are a little less rigid than a school board meeting that doesn't always give people the opportunity to have collaborative, inclusive, direct conversations, I think is really um, something that's key to making people feel really comfortable about what's going on in school um, and having them feel that they have that voice um, in making sure that they're part of that um, discussion and decision making process so we can work together. But thank you. That was a great question. Thank you, Moira. Um, thank you. Um, so I, I, as someone who works in education, I do have a difficult time getting into the schools during the school day, um, but I have volunteered to judge the science fair and convention convention, actually, sorry about that. Um, and, you know, I've, you know, volunteered um, to bake in things when we had the uh, big craft fair for the music room. Um, I will tell you, I had two students, two sons who went through the school district. Um, so I got to know many of the educators um, through that process. And certainly when I bump into them at the grocery store and things, they um, certainly feel, I, I believe they feel I'm approachable and they can reach out to me and speak to me and share their thoughts and concerns. Um, I do uh, value each and every one of them. And so hopefully they understand that as well. Um, like Carrie, I serve on um, a school board committee that does have um, districts employee representatives. Um, so hearing from them directly um, in that capacity as well. Thank you, uh, Jenny. Um, yes, um, like uh, the uh, uh, previous ladies uh, talked about volunteer. I also uh, like to volunteer in the community. And right now I am a volunteer to work with LifeBridge, which is a program that provides mentors for students at risk. Um, I know we have students going to Cobra, we have students going to Dover and Oyster River, and uh, I am being paired with a student at the, the Dover uh, Middle School. And uh, that's one way that I want to connect with our uh, community, and I am looking forward to meeting some of the uh, school administrators and teachers and just make myself available to, um, you know, work with them, uh, provide any support that I can. And uh, yes, I, like I said before, I am retired. So I have a, a lot of time in my hands to uh, uh, do community service. And that's what I plan to do, get to know the people that um, make the, the education happen. Thanks, Jenny. Adam? Can you hear me better? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so so I just recently on Facebook, uh, as it's been my best mode of communication, and I plan on emailing uh, both principals. I've, I asked for teachers to re uh, reach out to me as I really, I have not only a few questions for them, but I also wanna hear their, their concerns and they're right how to make Barrington School District uh, a little better when it comes to not only as educational but community community wide. So um, I I will be doing that. I will be reaching out more. more. All right, I'm really excited for our second conversation. Our forum will hopefully have in March, where I'll be able to bring some of those uh, questions, concerns, and ideas forward because I really want to know uh, what what we can do to make again make Barrington a little better. I know teachers are under a lot of stress for reasons that are out of their control and not only do I want to mitigate those reasons but I was, want to encourage them to be able to teach as they would like to and and really bring the best out of our children. Just like Jenny said I, I know our kids are are very resilient, very strong mentally, and they want to be challenged. 
challenge. And so I really want to challenge them. And I think our teachers probably have the best ideas with that since they are ground zero uh, with them during the school day. Hey, thank you. Uh, Gaffer? This is a really great question. It actually makes me really excited. Um, yeah, so connecting outside of just the school board meetings. Um, that's a lot of what I do at work. Uh, I have to do these big projects, like I said, and most of the people involved don't report to me. So uh, what I have found that works well in building community is being willing to listen above anything else and be willing to listen to pain, not just, oh, no, no, no. No, if you want to improve something, you have to find what's wrong. If you want to find what's wrong, you have to be willing to listen to people complain or gripe or express, you know, their sorrows and stuff like that. And that's where one you can build a really good rapport because you are there to generally listen. You are there to genuinely care. And also you can find what's wrong. A lot of times in my career, you know, if you have something at work that's just terrible and everybody knows it's terrible and even your boss knows it's terrible, but a couple levels above him did it. I'm usually the guy that actually fixes the terribleness. I'm the guy that will go up and down the chain, figure out what's wrong. Because at the end of the day, our teachers doing the work are our best chance to improve things, our best chance to make things more efficient, which will ultimately give better education to our kids and reduce cost. People think that you change things in big sweeping ways. A lot of times it's just bean counting and understanding this process takes two times as much as it should. You have that every day you save, every day you do better. So uh, about building community, definitely listen to the teachers. And I want to get parents more involved. I think to do that, you need organization and structure. You need to like an on-ramp, okay? You want, here's the list of things to do. This is where we're deficient. And then get them involved and get them on board and working in the system. Thank you, Gaffer. Uh, next question. Next question is from Chief Walker. Okay, Rick. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much to all of you for uh, running for the uh, school board and giving us the opportunity to uh, pick a candidate. Um, I spent uh, three years on the school board uh, about 20 years ago, and what was always near and dear to me was finding ways in which the town and the school could work collaboratively in the effort of making sure that um, our money was being adequately spent dollar for a dollar's service for a dollar's worth of work, and I still support that. I think we do a pretty good job, but we should do more. I'm a proponent of going back to a combined budget committee. I pose this question to the select board candidates prior to this. Uh, I'm a proponent of the reason I believe that is, is that if the school board put uh, three members up and the town put three members up, the six of them would be responsible for looking at the school budget, the town budget, warrant articles, and uh, getting a clear picture of what should or, you know, how we should spend the money that's available to us. If if elected, do you do you support looking at a uh, combined budget committee? Thank you. Thanks, Rick. We'll start with Moira. Uh, thank you, Chief. Um, so certainly I would support taking a look at it. Um, and I appreciate that you are proposing that there would be three members selected by the select board and three members selected by the school board. I'm sure you recall when we used to have a joint ABC, um, all of the members were selected by the select board. Um, and so sometimes what we found is that um, that uh, budget committee um, would be prioritizing um, what the town was trying to do. And I do think, you know, I've always said we all serve the same taxpayers and really the taxpayers don't care if it comes out of your left pocket or your right pocket. They want to know that it's, um, you know, being well spent. And, you know, we do try to collaborate as much as we can with the town. You know, when we were paving the ECL parking lot, we paved um, part of the parking lot that belongs to the town. You know, the rec department hosts things inside the schools, not only just the before and after school care, but um, athletic things like yoga at the middle school. Um, certainly we, you know, collaborate with BYA as possible, as much as possible too. So certainly the district has a philosophy and an, uh, 
a sense that, that we want to collaborate as much as possible with the town as again we we all serve the same taxpayers thanks moira jenny muted okay um yeah in in terms of having a combined budget um i personally would talk to the uh, experts the people that have done budgets before for the town and for the uh, school and you know ask them to give me what are their their pros and cons what how how having a combined budget will be better than not having it you know so have like a, a weighing the the pros and cons and uh then i would be uh, inclined to support the one that will be beneficial to both the town and the school because that's what we we want we want the town and the school we to thrive to be successful um and to have a bright you know, future and use our funds, our taxpayers' funds wisely. So I would just talk to the people that um, have done the budget before and pick their brain and see, you know, why do you think this will be a, a better idea? And then we'll make a decision. Thanks, Jenny. Adam? Adam? I do like the idea of a combined budget committee uh, for a number of reasons, such as what Jenny said, we school board, we deal, they deal with budgets in, in a sense of the school, but there's, um, there's lots of things that, you know, there's a lot of professionals that are missed there. And so if we have people with strong backgrounds with budgets, we would be able to really utilize and maximize our budget. Uh, and for example, at, at a school board recently, it might have been you, Chief, talking about uh, purchasing a new truck because the, the school truck just sits there and rots away. And as a man who's had a company vehicle for many years, I know about how trucks just rust away when they when they're sitting around. So we if we had a combined committee, we could potentially utilize town trucks to take care of the very small amount that the school truck does instead of spending especially now with how much vehicles are we could really save money on the school board if we and our school if we utilize that that partnership and there are many other things and and with that we could do things like uh you know the the, the field behind the uh caliphs that really just overgrows with get grass. We could we could combine together and and really utilize that space and make it better so and make it so the community can really enjoy it. And I think that's things that um, not only the school but the town can do. And we can get groups of of children to really participate, and that builds a community environment uh, as well as you know great. Um, Great, uh, excuse me. Okay, that's that's time's up, Adam. Uh, Adam. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Do I... Gaffer, go ahead. Hi. Um, yeah, I I think um, you should always look into something uh, and and see whether it makes sense. I'd like to speak to a bit about how I'd like that process to be to evaluate. I think before we just vote or uh, listen to ex experts or anything like that, we should establish what we're looking to get out of the change. You know, what what would be saved? What would it cost? Uh, things like that. And agree on that criteria before we start debating. Uh, I've found that's a good way to get objective buy-in uh, and not have, you know, people try to push agendas and stuff like that. Um, I think if if someone, you know, you know, really put me, put the spurs to me or whatever and asked, Anytime you can combine things and get an economy of scale, like we just talked about paving, is a good thing. Or what Adam just talked about, the truck, that's a good thing. So I, I think we'd want to make sure we make a good, thoughtful, objective decision. But out of the gate, I'd lean towards, you know, yes, because anytime we can collaborate, we can save. Anytime we get an economy of scale, we can save. Thank you. Thank you. Gary? 
Thank you for the question, Rick, and thank you for the, your service to the community. Um, it's greatly appreciated. And we have truly, um, from a school board's perspective, I know that all of us have appreciated the combined efforts that we've had in the past through facilities. And I think any time that we are working together collaboratively as municipalities to make the most out of our taxpayers' dollar and be as efficient as possible is always my answer will always be yes to that. Um, we've seen the benefits of that in the past. And I think what you're proposing is one step further, which is great, is equal representation from both boards, which both of us are the um, budget experts of our groups, bringing our needs together, our strategic goals together and planning for the future and saying, how can we align ourselves for our spending in the future taking into consideration future grant opportunities that we may have and also some limitations that we might have as grants um, discontinue and see how we can really help each other. And I really appreciate that initiative of a collaborative discussion beyond just you know emails back and forth about things here and there, but really long-term strategic planning, I think is only a benefit to our taxpayers, to our students, to our facilities, um, and to uh, the town of Barrington. So I, I'm very excited about that opportunity and I really hope that we can work together on that. Thanks, Kerry. Do we have another question? Yes, we do. Next question would be from Charles Walsh. Okay, Charles. Hi, can people hear me? Yes. Awesome. Um, so banning books has been in the news a lot lately. Uh, according to the American Library Association, last fall saw the highest number of book challenges in 20 years. Um, you have classics like Mouse, The Bluest Eye, The Handmaid's Tale. You know, they've been banned in places like, you know, Tennessee, Missouri, and more recent titles that cover you know, race, gender, uh, LGBTQ issues, uh, those are being targeted now. Uh, I personally feel this is a dangerous practice and uh, a great way to ensure that kids are denied learning about the world at large and about experiences of minorities and other marginalized folks. So my question to you all is where you stand on the practice of banning books from school libraries and curriculum. Thank you for the question. We'll start with Jenny. Right. I am a mother of two, and uh, I did not allow my kids to watch uh, uh, R-rated movies, uh, PG-13 movies, when they were not age appropriate. I think there are books that don't need to be in the library uh, because they don't add anything to the children learning reading, writing, and arithmetic. And I think you need to look at the age um appropriateness for certain messages. I would not uh, approve of certain books that uh, have no educational value. They're just uh, not beneficial to the education of a child or to their emotional. So um, I'm not into banning books for banning books like, you know, uh, Tom Sawyer, um, or Huckleberry Finn and things like that, that people are trying to ban, which are classics, but books that have no uh, place in a public, in a school library where children are, have a very tender mind and that are not helping them um, in their educational or emotional growth. I think that the parents need to be involved in that. Uh, as a, as a parent myself, I would go through the books in the library. And if I find something that is objectionable to one of my children, I would bring that up. And I said, you know, there's no way. So, you know, looking, uh, I would be looking out for the um, well being, welfare of the children, and for being an advocate for the parents because they do have a say and they are ultimately responsible for the children. And if they're Thanks, exposed Jenny. to things okay. that are not helpful, Sorry. Thank you, Jenny. Adam? So if we look at the, the public school uh, platform, public schools should really be focusing on history, social studies, language, math, science. There's many things that have been banned on. We, we see in the world today, uh, Amazon bans a lot of books. We see a lot of free speech being and banned 
We see a lot of books being banned. Uh, and and we we should focus as a public school on those key educational values and 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 matrix things that other parents and, and people may not believe in uh, to the parents to teach their children what they want to be taught. Social studies, history, language, math, science. Those are those are what public schools should be teaching. And if parents believe in other uh, things, then we leave it to them to what they teach their children, their values, their concerns, raise them how they want. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. If you can do anything to improve your connection there, uh, you're breaking up a little bit. So anyway, uh, do what you can before we get back to you. Uh, Gaffer. Thank you, Ron. Um, yeah. So our job as educators or educator adjacents is to prepare our children for the actual real world, not an ideal world, not a safe world, the actual real world. And in the real world, there are black people, there are gay people, there are Jewish people who are have either survived the Holocaust or have descend or descended from people who have survived the Holocaust. Do we want to introduce this at five years old? No. But what a lot of these books do is provide an on-ramp from the safe world that we create for our children in the ECLC, to the slightly less safe world in the elementary school, to the even less safe world in the Barrington Middle School. We we have to pre prevent. Pre uh, we have to have our kids ready for the real world, and these things happen in the real world. And um, I've talked to my kids about gay people. Uh, they're like, "What's that?" I'm like, "Oh, that's when a dude marries another dude." And my kids are like, "Oh, cool. Can I have some uh, mac and cheese?" Like, you know, the idea that it's dangerous to the kid is just not true. Um, I work in tech, as I've said. I work with all the different types of people. Uh, you know. Uh, you do your grocery shopping at 9 p.m. in Pakistan because it's so darn hard over there. Um, and if imagine you send your kid out and they don't know anything about this and they go to get a job, you know, somewhere outside of Barrington and they're just not prepared or they say things that they really shouldn't because it's insensitive. I don't want that to happen to any of our kids. And I don't think other parents should be preventing that. Um, I think our job with the school is to prepare kids for the real world. And that's that. Thank you, uh, Carrie. Hello, thank you for that question. I think it's an important one and certainly one that's in the media a lot these days as more and more books get added to that list. I absolutely, um, with my whole heart, do not believe that it is a school board's right or anyone's right to be banning books or putting them on a list and making them unavailable. I do agree that if parents don't feel like a certain text is appropriate for their child at any age or their specific age they're at, then of course that's their parents' um, choice to, to discuss that with their children or not have them read that. But I think when you start to talk about bleeding that into a school environment, education should never be about restriction. It should always be about expansion and um, learning and especially learning about experiences that they might not ex have here in our community. I mean, our school motto is giving students roots and wings and part of that philosophy is that not only are we inheriting them a love of our community, but we're preparing them for the world outside of Barrington. Um, and so I don't think that banning books in any way um, helps with that motto, and I believe in that motto. Um, and I certainly don't think it's a school's right to be participating in, in that. And, and again, just education truly is not about um, the restriction of knowledge. Um, and I think that's really truly all I can say about that. Thank you, uh, Moira. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I wholeheartedly agree with um, Carrie and Gaffer that um, we shouldn't be banning books. I think what our objective is, is to be preparing our students to be global citizens and to be a part of a global society is to recognize that other people have different experiences and to have some understanding of those experiences. You know, in the state of New Hampshire, parents do have the right to object to any materials for their child. Um, and then, uh, you know, the district would offer some kind of alternative for that activity or whatever. Um, I don't think books should be banned from the library and be banning access to students who want access to that, whose parents support access to that. Um, so I would be opposed to banning any books. 
Thank you. Uh, next question. Next question will be from Lindsay. Hi guys, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. So masking over the last year or two has been the topic that our school board meetings have been dedicated to. Um, but I want to hear from all of you on the other reasons that make you a qualified school board member. What brought you to the table other than masking? What is your agenda as a school board member to help further Barrington school district in our in our state? Thank you, and we'll start with Adam. So about I've talked about uh, America's founding, where America came from. There's many things to talk about not being taught to our children anymore. Uh, our children, we don't have a history of New Hampshire in our schools. How important would it be for uh, our children to understand New from our founding? prior to our founding through to today, New Hampshire is a very important state to the country, it always has been, as well as our constitution and our founding documents that really lay out the work of how America is so great. Uh, we talk about countries like Pakistan, you're not allowed to be gay in Pakistan. America is the most diverse country in the world where we have all stripes, all backgrounds, anything you want and and we we embrace it and so when we we talk about um, things like that i believe that we should get back to teaching the foundation of america and really giving the strength of that into children uh, as a soldier for many years i i've really you know i appreciate i've seen many parts of the world many many parts of the world and not in our new uh, America. And so if we teach our children those foundings, then we they have a better understanding on how it is. And so I believe that we should get back to uh, some education like that. And that's a big reason as, as a note taker for the military and, and uh, that I find it important to really get back to that education so we can get back to uh, the greatness that America is. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Your your phone or whatever you're on is breaking up tremendously. So I don't know if you have another device you might try to connect with, or I don't know if Clara, if you have any uh, suggestions for him. But uh, yeah, as a backup, the conference call, the conference number and ID is in the chat, and you can stay on for video, but have that as a backup. It's just a conference call from any regular phone, uh, landline, or cell phone. Okay, thank you, uh, Geffer. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, it's a good question. Um, when I was when I had just finished my first semester at UNH in like 1993, uh, there was a school. There was a town meeting in Merrimack, New Hampshire, and my parents were involved in the town. I was just some college kid, and they were voting on whether to have computers or the funding for computers. And I went up there. And I said, "Hey, I've been working in the computer clusters at UNH. All the majors now are using computers, so we might want to do that because isn't that what we're supposed to do?" And people cheered and they actually doubled the funding they were going to do. And I was like, the heck, like how did, you know, you can actually make a difference in this world just by speaking your mind. And then the mass thing came up and um, and then people said I should run. And I was like, really? No. But um, I looked at things and I think I'd be a good fit because I do. My job is to do big things, like I've said before, and I do big things not by I don't have that much power or really any at all, but I like solving problems, and like I said, I like listening to people's pain to solve that those problems. Um, and I just that really made me want to one realizing that I actually had the ability to make a change for good. I uh, I enjoy my life working remote for years now. This COVID thing is nothing new to me, and I've actually felt guilty that I can't give this to other people. And uh, I'd like nothing more than to help our kids be prepared for the world and, and have choice. I mean, that's what liberty is about is choice. And the better we educate them, the more choices we give them. And 
they can, you know, literally do whatever they want and be prepared for that. And that that's why I want to be on school board is that's what really made me run. Thank you, Kerry. So my journey to school board um, was a, a slow burn in the way that I started out just volunteering in the schools as my children were growing up through the schools, then, you know, joining the local parent group, the PTA and getting more involved with that. And then the more you're in the schools, the more you really just fall in love with it, the building, the people that work there, the students, and the more active I got there, I realized that um, what I was able to help stopped at a certain point with just a, a parent group. And so I started going to school board meetings before I was in the board, just listening and hearing what their strategic plans were and just being part of um, hearing their conversation and how they were deliberating. And I realized that I fell in love with that too. Um, and so that was my progression into what made me part of this. And I'm still in love with that. And then what keeps me going is realizing, especially today um, with the state legislators, um, legislative environment is that there's a huge um, opportunity for us to really represent Barrington at a state level, what our interests are, what things matter to us, and how they affect a town like ours is hugely important to me. Um, there are a lot of um, bills that are coming through that truly, truly impact us at a tax level, at a curriculum level, that um, if we don't put our voices in there to explain how they're going to affect our children, we're going to be at a loss. And so that's something that um, was fueled by my involvement in school through that process of just being a parent and wanting to help in a building that I really loved and, and help teachers that I just knew were just so amazing and they needed help. And so that's kind of hopefully answers your question both about how I got started into this and why I want to continue um, going forward with it. It's just been an amazing journey and it would be a, an honor truly to continue the work um, because we're not done and there's still so much more to do and so many more voices to advocate for. Um, and I hope to get the opportunity. Thanks, Kerry. Moira? Kai, thank you for the question. Um, uh, I've known I have wanted to be in education since the fourth grade when I was involved in a peer tutoring program. <laughs> um, and so um, throughout my career, I have worked at every level from kindergarten through adult education programs. I've tutored at the county jail. Um, so certainly um, education is a passion of mine. Um, and so that is why when I was looking for a way to give back to my community, I um, attended school board meetings for a year before I was elected. Um, so I was familiar with um, lots of things that were happening and how the board was acting. Um, and and, um, you know, I do have a master's degree in education, um, and I, I, well, I believe a, a diverse school board is uh, important. I do think having an educator on the board is also important. Thank you. Okay, Jenny. Yes, um, thank you for the question. Uh, what got me interested in, uh, you know, the school running for school board and getting involved in the uh, local education is first and foremost, I am a lifelong learner. I am a perennial student, love to do research about uh, important topics. And uh, I um, probably will continue to learn until the day that I die. But in any event, I'm a good listener. Um, I, uh, I have worked in the literacy program, uh, teaching uh, in a recent immigrants that couldn't speak English because I can speak both English and Spanish fluently. And I, you know, I was in the literacy program when we lived in Florida. That was a great experience uh, working with uh, people who really wanted to learn English. Um, I have uh, done tutoring. I love doing tutoring, both in English or Spanish. And um, I think I can be an asset to the school system, the, the children, uh, because, uh, well, I have extensive experience, not, not only as a teacher, but as a parent um, and as a military person, you know, that I've traveled throughout the world and lived in Southeast Asia and the Philippines and uh, Europe. So I have been exposed to many cultures and um, I can you know, draw from those experiences. And like I said, most important thing is I love to see a child 
you know, get the information and thrive. And you see the happiness in their faces when they get it. And that to me is one of the biggest rewards to see a child, you know, uh, get the message and, and be able to use it. So thanks, Jenny. Time, time's up for that question. Thank okay. You. Right, yep. Next question. Next question will be from Katie Cousins. Okay, okay Katie. Um, hi, thank you all for being here tonight and answering our questions. Um, my question is, what do you see are the biggest issues facing our school district and how would you address them? Start with Geffer. From what I've seen, thanks for the question. Uh, from what I've seen so far, it seems that we have too much centralization of power right now. Speaking of this from sort of a organizational operational perspective, um, it, it, it seems like there's a little bit too much micromanagement of the teaching and staff, and uh, that can be problematic for, for two reasons. Uh, I think first off, it makes the job less enjoyable. We have kind of high turnover and uh, if we can't increase uh, the funds so easy that we're paying people, we can at least make their job a little bit more enjoyable, enjoyable and empowerment is a good way to do that. The other way is uh, centralizing too much power can uh, cause too many inefficiencies. I think, uh, you know, not to bring the mass debate up, but using that time every two weeks to rehash the same arguments over and over again when the school board could have been focusing on things that, you know, actually impact education. I think would have been a better use of that time. So I think how things are run is the biggest problem because when you have friction in those gears, it affects everything. Everything slows down to some degree. So the biggest problem would be that friction. And, and, and one of my tasks would be sort of change how we're doing things to not have everything go through you know, the central board all the time. Let the teachers use their degrees to teach. Let the staff use their degrees to administer and uh, free up that time that'll make it more efficient uh, more enjoyable and you know more educational for the kids, which is the point. Thank you, uh, Carrie. Hi, Katie. Thank you for the question. Um, the, there are three things that I think that I would like to focus on um, beyond the fact that I really do think our school district is making strides, um, but there are always places and always room for improvement with any organization. So one, long-term funding. We do have a lot of our programs being, um, being held up by grants. And so what will happen to those programs do after the funding uh, resources are gone? Um, and how what will that look like, especially resources that are based off, um, that have staff related to them, staff expenses? Um, two, transparency with decision-making and communication from the board level. I do understand from a, a parent's perspective that unless you go to all the meetings or watch all the recordings and diligently read the pages and pages and minutes, things happen and you might not know about them until it affects your specific child. And that is um, a failure on us to not be more proactive with that communication. And there's a balance there between too much communication and overload and, and not enough. And I think we're still looking for that sweet spot in the middle. Um, and then three, community outreach. It's really hard to talk freely and have a conversation with the rules and policies that we have to abide by in a board meeting. Um, we do have um, uh, opportunities for the public to speak at the beginning, at the end of every meeting, but beyond that, there's not a lot of free flowing conversation. And so I really would encourage um, and look forward to opportunities where we can outreach more um, and also hopefully take some of the strain off the administrators and the staff who have to answer a lot of questions that the board's decisions are. Um, because they go to their teachers first or the principals first when it's really a board decision. And I think if we had some more community outreach, I think that would be truly, truly helpful. People are hungry for the information, but they're not always available at six o'clock every other Tuesday. So hopefully we can uh, work on those. But thank Thanks, you. Gary, Moira. You know, I would second um, Carrie's um, thoughts on uh, community outreach as someone who does not have children in the school any longer. Um, you know, I've, I've said multiple times, you know, we need to be finding ways to reach out to the greater community to make sure that they're aware of what we're doing um, and why we're doing it. Um, you know, I think uh, people are supportive of the school district and that's fabulous. And I think, you know, it'd be helpful for them to know. I mean, I think we've done lots of things, you know, uh, connecting with 
uh, community members, like, you know, if you think about Boy Scouts, there's been four Eagle projects at the elementary school, the Scout Troop painted um, picnic tables at the ECLC. Um, so certainly, um, you know, we're trying to reach out um, to community members who are no longer school district members. Um, the other thing that um, I am particularly wanting to be uh, mindful of is as you know, as you drive down Route 9, you can see lots of new buildings going up and being mindful of that potential impact to our schools. So we are looking at commissioning some enrollment projections to try and be able to um, project and plan for you know, potential increases in our school populations that could have an impact on our ability to educate kids as, as effectively as we are now. Um, and, you know, I, I want to find ways to increase um, the support for the teachers in the town and financially support them because what we hear on exit interviews um, much of the time is they're leaving um, um, not because of the culture or the climate of our district, but because of the pay that they can go to the next town over or a couple towns over and, you know, have a significant bump in pay. So I, you know, I think the contract that's coming up is the first step in that. And we've been making inroads in that with every contract negotiation, but there's still a little more work to do there as well. Thank you. Thanks, Moira. Jenny? Um, yes, um, thank you for that question. Um, the biggest problems, um, probably it's not the biggest problems, but the problems that I have seen uh, so far is uh, a couple. For example, are we getting our children prepared for the real world? Are we getting them prepared um, to be competitive in the world, in the real world out there once they leave our school? And we're spending a whole lot of money on each child each year because most of our property um, taxes go to the school system. So my question will be, um, are we preparing our children uh, in, in the commensurate to the, ex the expense that we're spending on each student? Now, when it comes to teaching children, I don't, I don't you know, uh, I don't think uh, uh, money should be a concern, but we raise the budget all the time and our children, we have less and less, uh, you know, good results. So I'm thinking that that's a problem. If we spend all kinds of money on the school system, but yet our children leave the school not being uh, competitive or being ready to be successful out there, that's one problem. Another one is I think that we need to teach history, reading, writing, arithmetic, and uh, you know, teaching them the constitution, teaching them the roots of our country uh, and civics to prepare them to be uh, ready to be our future leaders. So- um, hey, Thanks Jenny, that that's, that's time, okay? Thank All you. right, thanks. Hey, Adam? If you called in on your phone, you might have to press star six to unmute yourself. It's different than the mute button you might have on your phone. If you're having trouble with the phone, you might unmute yourself on the computer or device you're uh, in the Teams program with. Not looking promising. Uh, don't don't see any movement right now. There's a few participants uh, in by phone, but nobody's unmuting yourself again. That's star six. To be unmuted. Did you have anybody else for this question, Mr. Moderator? No, nope, no. Nope. Let's move ahead to the next question then. If we don't, uh, if we don't have a connection with Adam. Okay, in that case, Mr. Steve Saunders has the next question. Yes, Steve, thank you. Uh, takes a little yeah. while. And this is Steve Saunders. Um, the question I have for the board is, 
uh, not having children there, but being interested in, in the education of, of the uh, children of, of Barrington, um, having difficulty discerning what the curriculum and study plans are for all the schools that we have in Barrington, our two schools, and also for the three schools that are used for the high school level uh, children. Um, I'm, I've asked each member of the, the candidates if they feel that the parents understand what the curriculum and study plans are uh, for their children, and and do you feel that it, that you're effective in sharing what that curriculum is with Barrington citizens that may not be uh, um, and parents of kids in the schools? Thank you, Steve. We'll start with Kerry. So as far as the first, thank you for the question, um, especially as a, a person in the community who doesn't have children. I know that it's important that we reach out and we get this information to you. And curriculum is a huge part of the educational puzzle. And so as far as high school curriculum, that's something that definitely we can provide, but it is also provided on the, our high schools, um, the three high schools that we send our Barrington students to on their websites. Ours is also located on our website, but I hear what you're saying is, is it in an obvious place and is it digestible to any person that's not in education? I remember when I first moved into the district, I believe that we were starting to have forums about um, math and focus, and I, I went to some of those. Um, and I think that that's a great example of how we started it, a new curriculum focus and we educated parents about it. But at that point in time, I don't think virtual meetings were as popular. It was before COVID. And I'm not sure what outreach we considered as far as the people in the community that don't have children. And so I, I think you've nailed, um, hit the nail on the head on an area that we can improve on with communication. And I think that if we reach out and ask those people like yourself, how can we get that information out to you in a way that's digestible and, and something that you'd be interested in and that you could actually attend if you wanted it to be in person, I think that your feedback would be invaluable so that we can make those improvements um, in the future. So hopefully we'll be able to connect and, and get that outreach information out to to all the citizens of Barrington, not just the parents. Thank you, Moira. Um, thank you, Steve. Um, so uh, as Carrie mentioned, our curriculum is available, um, but clearly um, we could do a better job of communicating that to the school community and the wider uh, Barrington community. Uh, we do have a regular curriculum cycle, you know, when we revisit the cycle um, so that each year we're looking at a different um, curriculum area. Um, and so uh, it's something that we as a board do take seriously. You know, years ago there wasn't kind of a curriculum cycle. And so, um, you know, things could not get revisited for years. Um, so that is something that's happened in, the, you know, somewhat recent um, history. Um, you know, as far as the high schools go, um, you know, they do each have um, their own that are available. Um, and, you know, to um, Jenny's concern about if we're preparing our students for um, the future, what we consistently hear from all three high schools is that our Barrington students arrive at those schools prepared and, you know, they've are successful there. So um, that is some indication that the curriculums that we do have in place are appropriate. Um, but certainly being able to communicate that out to the greater populace um, is definitely an area that, as Carrie said, we can improve on. Thank you. Uh, Jenny? Yes, I think that, um, you know, each, each school district uh, uh, or any, even e each state will have educational standards and they publish this, uh, each school will have, I, I remember when I was uh, teaching at uh, a school down in uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania, you know, you have a, you know, the, your, your school is accredited and they go through your curriculum and they tell you exactly what each age um, or grade level is supposed to be teaching. And um, sometimes, you know, like snow days can really mess up your, your curriculum, but um, each school system should have uh, 
ready to present if, if any anyone in the community would like to uh, find out what this what are the standards for that grade level or for that school i think it's available and um apparently you know it's not publicly disseminated but um i'm sure that the schools are more than welcome to uh help anybody you know look through the the uh, the educational standards i think i don't think i would have any trouble you know just going there and say hey i'm a taxpayer i live here and can i see what are the standards for grade level you know eighth grade or seventh grade um so that's what i think thanks jenny uh is adam back in touch here uh, you sent me a message said that he was still um, having trouble, but he's active in the chat. Maybe he can try again on his computer. Okay, that'd be good. Okay, meanwhile, uh, Geffer, do you want to answer this one? Um, yeah, I think that's a, it's a really great question because unlike roads and like the fire department, it, it is something, you know, parents that have kids in the school district are more tapped in then people are not. And I think everybody pays for the school. I think everybody should have a window into whether we're being effective at educating our children. Um, like Carrie Moyer said, this is available, but the, you know, the, there's a whole internet out there. Sometimes it's hard to find stuff. And if we're not meeting the needs of all constituents, then we need to take that feedback and make it more accessible. I think, um, I agree with Carrie and, and Moira about making things more transparent and uh, providing what we're doing and why we're doing it. I, I think sometimes I personally have concerns, and this is a little bit of armchair quarterbacking, is are we preparing our, giving our kids enough pragmatic skills? Uh, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, that's all great and stuff, but do they know how to make a budget? Do they know what a mortgage is? Stuff like that. I sometimes worry that we focus too much on the past and not what is the future going to be. I remember as a kid myself, you're never going to have a calculator in your pocket. Yeah. Really? I got one now. You know, so, you know, do we need kids to do like five numeral division? Uh, I mean, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so to, to answer the question, I think things should be more transparent. And I think it's absolutely appropriate for every Barrington resident to make sure not that we put in a dollar and get a dollar back, but we get more than a dollar. We should be always investing and in getting more back, always preparing the kids for the future, because if our kids are more prepared, they get better jobs that raise the tax base and, you know, the community flourishes. So I think that's a great question and we should be more transparent. Thank you. Adam, one more time. Are you there? Can you hear me? Uh, yes. yes. OK, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm going to go back to the last question, if I may, because obviously you can hear me. <clears throat> and I, I really appreciated what um, just about everybody said on their points, but Gaffer really hit it hard where, where our teachers aren't are restricted in their teaching in many ways when it comes to being able to really go outside the scope of the curriculum and and teach their, the ways they want to. Um, I've talked to many teachers, I've talked to some teachers and and the salary issue like Ms. Moore, Ms. Taylor talked about is is a big issue and I don't know if that's why our matrix are falling like Frank told us before he left, but uh, the teachers are overwhelmed just by just by uh, trying to conduct the children to operate their masks properly. And I've, I've showed the school board how they have, they do not have the authority to mandate anything. And that is up to the New Hampshire legislator. So I've shown them where, where their oath and their authority lies. And, and they've overlooked that if they didn't overlook it and they, and they stopped with their uh, violations of their oath of office, then we wouldn't have these issue, issues and they could focus on on just school stuff and curriculum and improving and then the teachers wouldn't have to worry about the math and they would be able to just just focus on what they do teaching our children and so i think that's 
that's very important. And, and I've been blessed to recently learn a lot about our New Hampshire constitution personally, when it comes to, and with me getting with a constitutional group. And I think this is so, so valuable and the things that America has lost. And if we just paid attention to where our authorities are, then we wouldn't have these problems with the teachers being able to struggle and we'd be able to focus more on what we need to, to better prepare our children for the future. Okay, thank you. We'll give you a little extra time there since we missed out before. Uh, we have another question. We do, that would be from Carolyn Robbins. Hey, Carolyn. Hello there. Um, so I have, <laughs> I guess, in some ways, a little more of a comment than a question, um, but it is a, a question kind of directed towards Mr. Duguay. Um, I have, so my feeling about the running of the school board is that it's a board instead of one person because we need multiple people collaborating, working together, having your own opinions, your own ideas, but being respectful of each other and working together. And I have, uh, Mr. Duguay had mentioned earlier about the legal proceedings that he has brought against each of the school board members. And I have pretty significant concerns about how somebody who is involved in prolonged legal proceedings against the other members of the board, how they could possibly work in a board situation um, effectively. Um, I have concern as well about his ability to maintain a respectful um, collaboration with the other members since he has not been respectful at previous school board meetings. Okay, so Carolyn, if he has any comments about a, that, then uh, Carolyn, I, I would Carolyn, appreciate it. Carolyn, Carolyn, yeah, please form a question. Yes, my question is for. how he plans to handle um, And working together collaboratively when he is in the midst of a legal proceedings against each of the other school board members. Okay, well, that's specifically for Adam. Would you like to address that, Adam? Absolutely, thank you. Uh, clearly, in our Declaration of Independence, it, it states that if a government body becomes belligerent, that it is the duty of, of Americans, our citizens, to show them where they're wrong and remove them if they're violating our constitution. And so uh, Carolyn used the uses the word legal and I don't, I don't use that term. Uh, the constitution is written in common law for the common man and I'm just a common man. And so I've, I've started to learn the power of we the people and the power derives from us and the, any government agent is a substitute of the people. And so, I've been using common law to show our school board where they're in violation. And I, I didn't just come out and try to remove them. I, I gave them a notice to cease and desist where their authority does not derive them to do such things. And they ignored it. So then I served them with a sworn affidavit, which is common law. It's not, it's not legal. It's not the courts. It is the law that is granted under our constitutions. And so that's what I've done. And I've worked with many people that I don't see eye to eye with in many walks of my life. And I can fully guarantee that when it comes to a duty, the duty lies within that. And there's no, there's no uh, argument or, or um, disdain while while um, exercising that duty. So uh, that's what I have to say to Carolyn. Okay, thank you. We have time for one more question. Who's the lucky participant? I have a Diane. Oh, me too. That okay. is me, Diane St. Jean. Hello, thank you for all the candidates who are here and answering our questions. Um, I'm a recently retired Barrington teacher, and one thing that I think teachers struggle with is the vague legislation that has been enacted in New Hampshire that creates a climate of anxiety. Um, 
and and there's more to come. I, I think I'd like to hear about how the candidates feel about proposed legislation and recent New Hampshire laws that impact education. For example, House Bill 1671, um, the legislature is considering this bill, which would modify the state definition of adequate education. And if if you aren't familiar with the long history of adequate education in New Hampshire, it, it impacts funding. And what they are saying is that English science, math, and social studies constitute an adequate education, and it would loosen requirements for things like world languages, the arts, and computer science. So hopefully this won't pass, but how might this new definition of adequacy, if passed, affect state funding for education and our own offerings in Barrington in technology, the arts and world languages. Okay, I know you could answer that with a long answer. Uh, we're getting very late, so try to keep your answer to the uh, minute and a half if you can. Uh, we'll start with Moira. Uh, thank you, Diane, for that question. Um, I think, you know, through history of our state, adequate education has been argued at the state level, um, and consistently they've been trying to um, limit the state's responsibility for providing funds for education and pushing more responsibilities on to the local communities, including reducing what they contribute to retirement and everything. Um, I do not believe that just the basic core curriculum is uh, an adequate education. As I said earlier, you know, we're preparing kids for global citizenry and they need to be exposed to lots of things. Um, I do think in our state, it's unfortunate that we base our tax burden on a non-liquid asset and that makes it difficult for folks to pay their tax burden and we need to be mindful of that too but it's unfortunate that we're not we don't get enough support from the state um, to finance education and we've seen our federal grants decrease over the years as well okay uh jenny Well, that's the thing about, uh, like she says, the, the word adequate ed education is pretty vague. But I wonder um, if they were to write, uh, and I'm not in the legislature, but uh, I can talk to my um, state rep and, uh, you know, face to face and ask him, why are you not being more specific? Like saying, okay, the kids need to learn X, Y, and Z. Um, I think that that is something that needs to be left to the school district um, and to decide what an adequate education is as, as they uh, attempt to bring the kids to meet the educational standards for that grade level. Um, I think that it has to be vague because uh, otherwise they will have to be extremely specific as to what a what an a, excellent, let's say excellent education. That's vague too. You know, it could be anything. So I think um, by saying that adequate, uh, it's, uh, it leaves a, a lot for the school districts and for the towns to decide what is adequate for their uh, students, I believe. That's, that's my opinion. Okay, uh, Adam? Growing up in Rochester, um, <clears throat> and when I talked about languages earlier, when it when it comes to other languages, Spanish, my son's in seventh grade and he's learning Spanish. And I just thought that was so great that in, in middle school, we've already uh, started teaching our children uh, that and, and other things. And so when it comes to legislation and things like that, uh, it should really be up to the community what curriculum is taught and not a legislator the the communities know what's best for their children and and so the 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 legislator should give the give that authority to uh the, the community as a whole to to decide what they want to teach and and the best ways to teach it the problem is is we're just, we're so hampered by uh government funds that we can't we can't control what we teach and 
and this is a perfect example of it. Um, and so I believe that if if we want to talk about legislation from Concord, we should talk about giving the authority to the communities to best teach their children. Okay, thank you. Gaffer? I think it's a giant mistake to think we actually set educational standards. The world sets educational standards. The outside community sets educational standards. We can't decide that penmanship is important and therefore we're going to teach it and expect our kids to be successful because they can write in cursive. That's just not true. It's maybe not a popular thing. Maybe this will prevent me from getting elected, but it's the truth. We, we are at, we are already in a global community. Uh, it's already happening. We're already here. There are people like me that work, you know, literally all over the world from my my room. Um, and if we want to compete, we have to teach what the world is actually going to do. And uh, arithmetic ain't it. Computer science is. Uh, that's I, I'm not saying it to be mean or arrogant or whatever, but that that's the truth. Um, I don't know if anybody knows what an H-1B visa is. But it's basically because we don't have enough Americans able to work six figure tech jobs, we invite people from other countries over to do it um, because we aren't churning out enough people. I work in tech. This whole hiring problem, we've been doing, dealing with this for like 20 years. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's nice to think that we're empowered to do things, but the world will decide what's valuable and what's not. And either we can stay with that and stay with it or we can fall behind because we are starting to fall behind. That's that's the truth. It's it's not nice. It's not happy. But um, yeah, I, I think uh, that legislation should scare the hell out of us because that will literally hurt us and hurt our children's future. And we should work towards uh, stopping that. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, Carrie. So thank you for this question, and this is a very scary um, piece of legislation and a long list of legislation that's being um, delivered to the state of New Hampshire right now in this new legislative season. And really all it is requiring us to do now as a school would be education, language, arts, math, social studies, and science, and that is it. And they're saying that it's because, well, now you can reduce your budgets that you've been wanting to, and now you can think outside the box and combine curriculums. But really what that means is that, especially for towns like us that rely so heavily on our property taxes, you will now have to have local taxes cover those subjects at a higher rate. And it means that it will be very disparate between two towns that literally could be neighbors and have such different um, curriculums of education and opportunities for students that it would be like night and day. So across the state, that would mean that while, and I do love the idea of keeping things local, I also believe that New Hampshire's education system shouldn't be so disparate um, and so overly localized that it means that if you, that you basically have the poor luck of the draw if you just happen to be in a school district and live there and can't move for whatever reason, and then your child suffers because of that, um, because of this over-localization in what core curriculum means. No one asked legislation to look at this. I don't truly really believe that their reasoning for it is valid. I think it just sounds good, and I think it really truly is going to hurt communities like us and only make our tax rate go up if we want to continue what we all agree are important subjects. And so I truly will continue continued as I have already written to both Frank Edelblatt and to um, Governor Sununu that these are really, really hurtful tactics to the education system at a time where it's already very divisive and we should be talking about how we're going to build our education system up instead of tearing it down. Thank you. Great job, everybody. Um, let's just wrap up with like a quick uh, 15 second sound bite from everybody with uh, the important thing you want to leave in everybody's mind. Uh, and then we'll wrap it up. We'll start with Adam. I just want to say thank you for everybody who's participated. Thank you for all the candidates. Thank you for Ron and Connor, especially uh, when it comes to me. And I, I just want to say I, I've really enjoyed this opportunity. I didn't think, you know, a year ago, two, two years ago that I would be having this discussion and you know I, I really feel honored uh, it's it's a new duty and and I appreciate it and I take it seriously 
And I think that we can really make Barrington a better educational system by many of the things we're talking about with expanded education. Uh, you know, I, as, a, as an electrician, I know how valuable trades are. And I, I would like to expand that expand that right here in Barrington before we move on to Dover, which has a great trade system. And trades nowadays aren't just, uh, you know, electricians. Okay. Adam, Adam this is a quick sound bite to end it, so. Okay, well, <laughs> I, I thank that's you gonna, very much. Yeah. I just wanted, I thank you very much, everybody, for your participation. Thank you. Okay, Jeffer? I just want to say, um, I already work as a global citizen, and I just want to make darn sure that all our kids are ready to be global citizens as well, and that they're prepared and free to choose. Uh, you know, I don't want people to be liberal or conservative, or whatever. Let them choose. And I want to make sure we give our kids the best education we can and make them ready to just rock on in this world. Thank you. Thank you everyone for doing this, by the way. It's it's awesome that we can, you know, do government this way on the internet and uh, ask all sorts of questions. It's just amazing. What a great world we live in. Yeah, thanks, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who came out tonight. I know it's time away from your families and it was a long night for you guys just as much as it was for us. So thank you for sticking with it, for bringing really hard hitting questions that matter to the table. I appreciate that. And I just urge everyone to remember, I know masks seems like the end all be all today. And I know it, and it is at this moment, I guess, for some people today. Um, but what I urge you to remember is that don't make a short-term decision that has long-term consequences. These are people who are going to be in charge of so much more than just masking, as I truly don't believe that it's going to be something in our future for very much longer. And I really encourage you to remember what the purview um, and the gravity of what a school board does and the effect that it has on your children, your taxes, the town, the community um, truly has. So I, I thank you for being here and I hope to have the opportunity to continue to serve. Thank you, Moira. Uh, thank you, Connor and Ron, for arranging this. Thank you for everyone that uh, stuck with us over time uh, to listen to this and participate. You know, I just want to also thank our teachers, our administrators, uh, the rest of the staff in the Barrington School District because they have done a phenomenal job through some very extraordinary times. Um, I, you know, I'm a, I've been a resident for over 25 years and I've been in education for over 30 years and I have a master's degree in education um, and I have enjoyed having the opportunity to serve the community for many years and hope to be able to continue to serve the community going forward. So thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, yes. Um, my main point that I want to make as a closing uh, comments is that I uh, want to be an advocate for educational excellence for all of our children and uh, that um, I would also be an advocate for parent participation in the education of their children uh, and whatever I do I put all my heart into it I am a hundred percent committed and and I give it my all so that's my closing argument. Thanks. Thanks all you candidates for participating. Thanks for all the people at home for watching and asking a lot of questions. You know, we've had a lot of candidate forums in person, but we've had a half a dozen candidate spouses in the audience, and that was about it. Uh, this is much <laughs> more fun. Uh, the participation has been great. I know Connor needs to put your, your kids to bed, and uh, thank you so much for, for uh, running things tonight. Uh, they better be better. Are you kidding me? Nine o'clock. <laughs> they, their yeah. tent was up. Yeah. Uh, we'll see you all on uh, on March eighth. Good luck there, and uh, you know, keep getting your your word out there and uh, advocating for the school. So great to see you all. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Good job. Good night. Thanks Thank so you. much. God bless. Thank you.